So picking up where we ended the other day, what was it, like a mid-afternoon or so, we're going to be talking about the body defense mechanisms, and as you can see here, these three lines of defense. We've looked at the anatomic barriers to some degree already. We were talking about mucous membranes, skin, uh, the epithelial tissues, and such like that. But now we're going to go further. It, we're going to move into inflammatory and immune. We've mentioned inflammatory response. Um, we will see more of that, um, but also diving into the immune response and how that works and how complex it is. This is a section, again, that's super easy to be frustrated with and be like, why does this matter? Well, the paramedicine, some of our most concerning situations that we deal with are related to the inflammatory or immune response processes. Things like epi... Um, yeah, wow. Well, epiglottitis is, but uh, what I was trying to say was anaphylaxis. Situations like anaphylaxis, sepsis, a lot of viral and bacterial infections of even less significance than sepsis. Um, these are all related to the inflammatory response and immune, uh, the immune system pneumonia, uh, UTIs. So we see this. Um, progression quite frequently and knowing which treatments are going to be helpful and knowing how they're working is going to help us make the right choice for our treatments in the field knowing hey this might be the time to hold the inf the anti-inflammatory or this is a time to give it or so on and so forth how do we know when to <clears throat> how do we know when to move to the next um level of treatment or something along those lines. So there's a lot here. I think that if a biology uh, professor uh, or an a, you know, you know, immunologist were to listen to this lecture, they would be quite annoyed with me and um, probably make me feel like, not, um, like I was nothing. But my goal here is not to be so technically precise with this description that you lose me but to put it into terms that are understandable we're not going to be testing you on your names of all of the different inflammatory mechanisms we're not going to be testing you on all the different steps of the uh, clotting pathways and immune response pathways and activations but what we are going to be looking for you to have is a fundamental understanding of how the system is working so what i intend to do is put this in terms that you're going to be able to grasp quickly and easily that when you see a patient with an inflammatory response or an immune response you will be able to recognize it and not just know what to do, but here's the real key. This is what takes you from being a mediocre, whatever, you know, we're here kind of a medic to the exceptional paramedic, the paramedic that really is um, thinking ahead. And that literally is thinking ahead. What I want you to be able to do is predict where the current patient's, the patient's current status will take them. So. That's why I wanna introduce some of this uh, <clears throat> and get into it a little bit more so that you have the ability to predict where the patient's condition is gonna take them. Perhaps the word would be better suited would be anticipate where their condition's gonna take them. All right, so we know anatomic barriers. I talked about the skin. We've got hairs in our respiratory tract, um, acids in the stomach. Um, I know this might sound like a gross um, description or a gross thing, but this is actually the truth that um, when you are breathing and you, you have your hair, hair in your nose, you're breathing in dust. Well, the dust is going to have parasites like mites. It's going to have... Um, bacteria, viruses, and things like that. And those get trapped in the hairs, not cilia, but the hairs in your nose and in the mucous membranes of your nose. Why? Because if they didn't get trapped there, they would go into your lungs. And if they go into your lungs, that's a very thin membrane layer between the outside world and your bloodstream. Um, 
that outside world or those um that membrane is very susceptible in, to infection and you know infections in the lungs are a problem so your nose catches all of that stuff and then it co collects it into hard hardened dried chunks right and we call those boogers right well it's all there so that you can blow it out and get rid of it right now the funny thing is if that stuff in that booger went into your lung it could make you very sick because it's pathogens and stuff but if it went into your stomach the acids in your stomach would destroy it to where it wouldn't cause any issue whatsoever ever again so when you take your uh when you blow your nose and you throw the boogers away you're just leaving them in the world for somebody else to get sick by so you know take that for what it is but all joking aside our stomach acid is hydrochloric acid with a ph of about one and if you were to pour that directly onto your skin it would scar you literally for life um emotionally and physically but with the mucous membrane that we have on the inside of our stomach that actually is in resistant to the acid and protects our stomach lining we're able to um process and destroy a lot of the uh pathogens that enter our bloodstream now interestingly enough you're like so how do we get food poisoning well some of the bacteria a lot of the bacteria that we um get food poisoning from have what's called capsules and they're basically the bacteria has shrunk down into a partial structure that is highly protected with a very tight capsule and could live in the harshest of conditions for years before it entered an environment that was conducive to life um and then it just turns back into a bacteria so um some of those bacteria can be ingested in capsule form and survive the the acids of our stomach but actual living bacteria that enter our stomach acids they do not survive which is why when you get immediate food poisoning like you eat food and then within a couple hours you're showing a problem you're not actually getting poisoned by bacteria you're getting poisoned by the toxins that the bacteria left like the listeria or the botulinum toxins or something like that like the food what had botulism or something and you're basically reacting to the toxin and the toxin wasn't able to be destroyed by the bacteria by the acid because it was resistant to the acid when you get some of your other things like salmonella or e coli these are longer acting these might take several days before you see the symptoms because the bacteria has to basically regerminate go from the capsid uh capsule you know um dormant state into the active live state again and um start replicating and then it has to replicate a certain number of times you know i think e coli doubles like every 20 minutes um, one of the reasons they love to use it in science for so many different things is it's very rapidly replicating so it doubles it splits every 20 minutes so your um bacterial colonization is doubling every 20 minutes so one two four eight you know and so on and as you can imagine it starts to really balloon there after a while and that's why it can take a, a little while for e coli to really kick in and uh get to a dead not well it can be deadly but get to a really caught um concerning level so those are some, how some of those barriers are going to work in our body it's one of the reasons why you want to make sure that you have decent stomach acid excessive use of antacids and proton pump inhibitors and such those are um definitely going to decrease your um resistance to illness um, so we're going to look at some more of these things as well. All right, so...
these are two different ways that can happen. Um, bodies, foreign substances, abnormal growths in cells, changes within the interior of the cells. The changes in these cells could be involved, could be a uh, infect infection with a or infestation really with a virus um, not necessarily that the cell has changed but that a virus has entered the cell and that causes the protein markers on the cell to be changed um, but anyway lymphocytes is where we're going to see the b lymphocytes and the t lymphocytes you know the b cells and the t cells anybody know why they're called b cells and t cells do what Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear whoever was talking first. I, it, I heard you were talking, but I couldn't hear what you were saying. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's not how they're shaped. It is where they mature. So actually all cells, all immune cells come from the bones, right? The bone marrow is where cells are formed, but the um, Savannah camera is being cuckoo again. Sorry, guys. Um, hey, Savannah, one option you could do, if you can hear me, I can't tell, um, one option you could do is just log in from one of your laptops, and uh, even if I can only see one or two of you at a time, just use your laptop as the, um, the login system. So, all right, so all blood cells are developed within the bone marrow. However, B lymphocytes are typed and matured within the bones. So their whole maturation process start, starts there and ends there. And when they're released from the bone marrow and from the bone, they're ready to do their job. And um, they're out circulating. They, they are what we would consider a pretty standard um, immune cell, white blood cell. The, um, now, T lymphocytes, they are developed and um, mature in the thymus. The thymus is that gland in the center of your chest that um, sits right in front of the heart, right in front of the aorta, the descending aorta, ascending vena cava, so right about here. It's very large proportionately and well-developed in children, um, and that is... Uh, kind of the anthropologic connection to why kids put things in their mouth. Um, as adults, we're often disgusted by watching kids play and interact, you know, starting as soon as they can move around up until good knows how old. Um, they, it's like every time they meet something new, they're, they're wanting to lick it, touch it, put their mouth on it, put it in their mouth, chew on something, um, eat dirt, whatever. This is rather concerning when we watch it because we're like ew that's gross you don't know where that's been and you know some of that is very true because there's residue that's definitely harmful but in the typical wild world that has not been um contaminated with particularly infectious conditions, that is actually the healthiest thing the kid can do. Uh, playing in the dirt, uh, getting filthy, then eating lunch by and forgetting to wash their hands, that kind of stuff exposes them to a myriad of different bacteria, fungi, viruses, um, even to, the, to some degree parasites and such that their body as a in, as a child as a toddler as a young child has an incredible ability to build resistance to so one of the reason kids pop fevers like nobody's business at the drop of the hat and it's because they're trying to type responses to every new organism and pathogen they come across um, and that thymus is doing that work. It's creating massive quantities of T cells. It's a huge demander or, um, of energy. It's uh, constantly demanding uh, high metabolism levels. So it's a very active organ. And kids living in that world are, um, you know, living that way are much healthier for doing so. Now, I'm not by any shit stretch of the imagination advocating for kids playing in cat boxes or chicken coops, okay? P please don't misunderstand me. There's definitely a point of um, pathogen overload, but um, a lot of really interesting studies have pointed to that 
Uh, kids raised in homes where moms want to Clorox everything and everything has to be constantly wiped down and they can never play on the floor. They have to be on a blanket and they can't play outside. Then they, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Those kids end up with a very underdeveloped immune system and become far more susceptible to disease processes as they age. Whereas children that were, and I mean, in some ways you could say the country kids, the farm kids, the kids that were raised out in the dirt and in the woods and all that all the time. Those kids have a very strong immune system because they met those pathogens in small doses, their body typed to it, and uh, they were much healthier. Um, one of the reasons that we as uh, members of developed societies, um, and developed meaning like infrastructurally developed with high high standards of water purity and food purity and all that well uh, don't get me started on that one but anyway the reason why you go to mexico or some other country on a vacation and they tell you don't drink the local tap water only drink bottled water well the reason is there are bacteria and pathogens and such in that water that your body has never learned how to type to and you will get very sick if you're exposed to it now why do the locals drink it why can't they don't why don't they get sick well because they've been exposed to that stuff since childhood and they have typed um immune responses to them and they are immune they they will they are resistant to that pathogen um and there was a study published by oxford or was it is either oxford or it was an, one of the ivy league schools here in the u.s but it was um it was published a few years ago it was before covid and all that and they basically said that the modern society was doomed in the event of a um kind of a an apocalyptic event because we have not been exposed to enough mold fungus bacteria um in our foods and in our life um, daily life that if there was a, an apocalyptic event and our current foods production methods were to be lost the uh, any any member of a developed society would die and that the only uh, communities left the only cultures left would be those that live in a very um, indigenous uh standard or a very indigenous method basically anyone um in america would not survive because we're not exposed to it and they were actually proposing that we needed to come up with ways of ingesting more worms and fungus and molds and bacteria in our diets in order to uh, strengthen our immune system and make us more resistant to as a society to infections and i was like wow that is <laughs> talk about opposite of what we would normally hear or expect so this is kind of trying to give you the concept for how incredible and useful our immune system is and how um, broad it is so what is the past process? What are we going to see and deal with? <clears throat> so we have different bacteria, and this is, we'll, we'll use a bacteria because it's one of the easier um, examples to explain. <clears throat> I'm trying to think how I want to do this. There's this video that I like to show on YouTube that, you know, I'm gonna explain it through, I'm gonna talk through it, kind of get you familiar with some of these terms and all that kind of stuff, and then we'll watch the video and I think it'll make more sense because it'll uh, summarize it all. All right. <clears throat> so, um, the bacteria in our body, in multiple different ways whether it's through a cut through um our food or so, any of those kinds of things remember there's approximately or if there should be approximately two trillion bacterial cells in your body in fact within the confines of your skin there are more bacteria cells than there are human body cells 
human tissue cells because that's how symbiotic we are with bacteria. Bacteria are not a bad thing. There's just certain bacteria that when they get out of uh, balance with the other bacteria, they become harmful. Now, we have infectious bacteria on the surface of our skin all the time. We are covered in staph and strep and um, tons of other bacteria. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen this, uh, pull it up, I love this picture. Um, Here we go. All right. Um, all right. So this is a petri dish of a toddler's hand. They just took a basic handprint, put it on the petri dish, and cult cultured it. And these are all of the. Um, colonies of back, various bacteria. Every color, every shape, every one of these is different. Uh, a different type, not just a different bacteria, but a different type of bacteria. Um, they probably drooled in this spot way out here on um, by itself. Um, and that's what caused that. But all of these bacteria are working together or working against each other. Notice how we have this large sunburst pattern down here. If I remember correctly, that should be a staph um, bacteria, staphylococcus type bacteria. Um, notice how it's all alone and isolated. Does anybody know why? So when a bacteria is trying to compete for nutrients. And this is on an, a Petri dish of auger, so this is a nutrient-rich um, material that it's on. It will essentially try to compete against other bacteria and fungus in the area. And so bacteria secrete chemicals that kill other bacteria, same with fungus. And so that's why this one bacteria colony here that grew so nicely is completely isolated from everything else because instead of being symbiotic to the other bacterias, it's in competition and sending out chemicals that were preventing or inhibiting the growth around it. Now, you're like, okay, but what about this spot right here? Why are there other bacteria? See how they're a different color? Why are there other colonies growing close? That's the crazy thing about bacteria. These particular colonies have developed a resistance to the antibiotic and that's where the term comes from, but the antibiotic chemicals that this larger bacteria colony is releasing. So these are now resistance, and we'll get into that when we talk more about antibiotics later and how um, antibiotic resistance is such a big deal. So this is simply a handprint culture of a child's hand or a culture of a handprint and showing how much bacteria is um, covering our skin surface. You can see the myriads of designs and colors and shapes um, and patterns that these, we got some mold growing over here, um, which is a fungus. So like it, it's just incredible. The, uh, the biodiversity that is in our skin, just on the surface of our skin. Which is why if you have a immune suppression condition, let's say, you know, we'll use the big one that everybody always talks about. Let's say you have AIDS, okay? You have AIDS and AIDS prevents your immune system from functioning adequately. Another option could, let's say you have UC, ulcerative colitis or autoimmune disorder. And so you're taking immunosuppressants on a daily basis in order to keep that autoimmune disorder under control. Well, you're going to have a decreased resistance to infection. And so those resistance could release or lead to a um, 
a opportunistic infection where you're basically your natural defense the ones that we're going to be talking about here lose their ability to fight infection and then that normal uh infection level or that normal bacteria level on the surface of your skin actually starts causing inflammation and infection so the people are people who are on cancer treatments people who are um, immuno, major immunosuppression, they'll just burst out into staph infections all over their skin because their body no longer can fight and the staph just starts taking over. So, let's back to our PowerPoint here. How does this work? The bacteria enters the body through whatever route necessary. Macrophages will tend to ingest it. Now, encapsulated and non-encapsulated are um, referring to what I was talking about. But, well, not exactly, but somewhat about what I was talking about before with the um, capsules or the capsids that are around our bacteria that enter the stomach and live. Those are really, should I should have referred to them as spores um, because that's where the bacteria kind of squeezes into this hardened shell. Um, Whereas the capsule is kind of a um, dew or gel-like substance that's around the bacteria that protects it. With that gel, macrophages cannot phagocyte. Um, that's why they macrophages, um, they cause phagocytosis. They swallow the bacteria whole. Um, <clears throat> encapsulated cells they have this gel gooey gel around them and macrophages don't recognize them so they have to be typed by antibodies antibodies have to trigger them and then the macrophages will rec recognize that they're um there and we'll show you that process later all right so these are how um our body will work if we can't immediately ingest if the macrophages can't immediately ingest the bacteria then antibodies will do something like this they'll target the capsule they'll um which basically by attaching to it they then attract a macrophage to them kind of like if you play call of duty and you want to call in an airstrike and you have to use the laser designator to paint the target in the game that's what these antibodies are doing they're tagging that bacteria painting the target so that the macrophage can come through and swallow it up and recognize oh this is a problem we need to get rid of this guy now another way of doing it is the cell wall activates the complement system the cell um the cell wall of the bacteria's complement system will be activated, mean, meaning it will actually start um, releasing chemicals that attract other macrophages to it. So it's not so much the targeting as much as it's um, the complement system makes the cell wall more attractive to the macrophage. It's kind of, it's definitely different, but we don't need to get into the details on that one too much more so you're encapsulated get targeted by antibodies they're coded by um the antibodies and then the macrophages will be able to ingest it the complement system the antibodies aren't really targeting it there but other processes are making the bacteria more desirable um to the to the end of, to the macrophage and then the membrane attack complex this is a process where the uh antibodies activating this complex and that complex being formed means bacterial wall right the cell wall of the bacteria will actually be bored through the membrane will be split open and then the contents of the bacteria will be released or water will be allowed to go in and then the cell will crenate or lice depending on the circumstances and basically self-destruct so it's kind of like activating the self-destruct button at, at the end of an action movie and it, bacteria is just Die. memory b cells and t cells being activated is a different process memory b cells will find the bacteria's information they'll take pieces of it and 
store it and say, next time we see this, we know to attack it right away. And then they, they'll already have formed antibodies of able to be released and it cuts out several steps of the process. Now the T cells, T cells are, like I said, they form in the thymus, they are killer cells. Now there are some helper T's and things like that, but for the most part, they're killer. Where a, um, where a, a macrophage might swell or uh, swallow the entire bacteria whole and eat it, a T cell would connect to it and basically detonate it. It will inject it with some DNA and cause it to implode from the inside. The same process works on other tissue cells. So like in our body, when our cells become virally infected or our... Um, or there's an organ transplant and there's foreign or organs in our uh, foreign tissue in our body, our T cells will attack those cells and trigger them for self-destruction. And they'll just um, blow, well, basically destroy the cell on their own. And they're very effective at that. Um, so here's a long list of all of the different types of cells that we have within our immune system. Um, you'll recognize a lot of the beginning ones, base, OE, eosinophil, neutrophil, monocytes, lymphocytes, macrophage. These are all our common white blood cells that we uh, refer to. Now, the macrophages are very large. Um, they're also... Um, more specific and typed to the the condition that you need them to be dealing with they're very effective but they're unique um whereas the monocytes they are just out there doing whatever they want they patrol anything that seems like it shouldn't be there they destroy it um Whereas the macrophage, they're gonna be more unique and specific to this type of an attack. So you will see the macrophages on blood tests when the patient has a well-developed infection. Mast cells and um, basophils, we'll talk more about them later on, but basically they're the same type of cell, it's just the difference is where they're found, but they're what we would call granulocytes. They are what release histamines and they release leukotrienes and chemical mediators. They're kind of like the watchdogs. They are the sentries, um, they sound the alarm when there's a, a invasion or an infec infection. Then you have the helpers and the memories, um, and oh, I already kind of mentioned the T cells a little bit uh, before. And we'll, we'll break some of these down more as we go. But this is just kind of that description. Do you need to remember every single one of these and what their jobs are? No, you do not. That is not the purpose of this class. But I'm explaining these all to you so that you can just have a, hey, there's a blood cell that does this. There's a blood cell that does that. There's, this is why they work together. So um, I'll try to give you enough detail that you can follow, but then back it up and simplify it so that we can understand. All right, so natural immunity. Natural immunity is our essentially our monocytes. They don't care. They don't know what it is. They're just out there roaming, looking for anything that doesn't look like it's supposed to be there, and they'll destroy it. And they're pretty good at it, but they can be easily overwhelmed because there's only so much that they can consume. When you get a cut on your skin and it starts to get infected and gets pussy and you see that purulent discharge and that, you know, the pus coming out of it. Pus is a bunch of dead monocytes. That is what it is. It's a bunch of dead white blood cells that have literally eaten themselves to death on bacteria and have uh, built up in that tissue. So while yes, you wanna clean the pus out and get it out of there because the swelling is gonna hurt the tissue um, and you wanna make room for new white blood cells to get in there, Pus is actually our body doing its job. Um, and yes, it can be contagious and infectious. Like there's stuff there, so don't get somebody else's pus on you. Um, 
All right, so that's natural immunity. We have many other responses there. Now, the other process of immunity is acquired. This is what we talk about when somebody gets an infection and then they make antibodies to it and then they have memory cells for it and things like that. Those are where our um, you're exposed, you type a response, and the next time your response is faster because you um, already had a previous exposure. Uh, this is why you might catch the flu one time, be sick for two or three days, feel like crap, be miserable, and then you're over it, you're better, you move on. Well, you might get exposed to that same flu again. You might, you might feel sick for like an afternoon oh i think i might be coming down with something and then all of a sudden you're perfectly fine that's because you've already been exposed to it before your body doesn't have to mount this massive uh operation to figure out what's invading you it recognized it your in antibody load skyrocketed and the viral load was destroyed before you even um knew you were sick now, that's acquired immunity. This can be done by a natural acquired immunity or a wild um, acquired immunity where um, you just can contract a disease in, the, uh, in life, or it can be done by a injection of, um, uh, of that bacteria or virus type pathogen or an inert virus and we would call this a vaccine because you're injected with it it produces a immune response and now you have acquired immunity passive acquired immunity is a little different um, passive acquired immunity is not receiving parts of the bacteria or virus to type against it's receiving antibodies an injection of antibodies the most common the most uh, well known and frequently used is mother to infant in breast milk mother's breast milk is full of antibodies which if you've ever heard people arguing about breast milk versus formula or whatever that's probably one of the biggest reasons they make the argument that breast milk is better um, is because antibodies are in it and they're from that mom to that baby whatever the exposure that the baby had the mom had so it's helpful whereas we're not able to put we're not able to infuse uh formula with antibodies so that's really the big that's one of the big differences between another form of uh passively acquired immunity is an injection of immunoglobulins anybody in the class been in the military and deployed overseas Get any hands okay when you were deployed did they give you a whole bunch of injections You're like hey we're sending you to southeast asia for six months or whatever did you get like a whole list of injections before you went those were probably told you were probably told those were vaccines right There you go. You were told to stand there and take it. Well, actually, that's microchips for mind control. <laughs> no. No, what it really was, most likely. Now, there's some of them that were probably uh, vaccines, but the reason you have to give them before deployment, and then you might get them when you come back or halfway through the deployment, is because they're not actually vaccines. What they are is immunoglobulin injections. They are antibodies. They are not, they are not bacterial or viral um articulate that your body is going to react to they are the actual injections of antibodies saying hey we know you're about to go see dungu fever and malaria and all these other things so um we're gonna give you antibodies for these diseases so that you have a better chance of resisting them when you get there now these antibodies will only last for a certain period of time so we'll have to re-inject you and get you a booster all right you're boosting your antibody load following this is not the way a vaccine is supposed to work and i'm not trying to get political so please don't turn it into 2020 again but immunoglobulin injections require frequent boosters just like your tetanus booster you're not actually getting exposed to tetanus you're getting a passive injection of tetanus antibodies now there are there's two different ones okay there's two different tetanus injections and one is tetanus bacteria particulate um 
cell fragments that you're being uh, exposed to, and the other is just an immunoglobulin booster. And they're like, hey, when was the last time you had a tetanus shot? Well, that's they're talking about the booster, and that's why you have to get it so frequently. That's why if you get cut and you're like, oh, you might have been exposed to tetanus, would giving you particulate of the bacteria actually help you speed up the inflammation process if there's tetanus bacteria already in you? Not really, not necessarily. It could, depending on, let's say you're diabetic and that bad circulation down there, maybe that would, but really what it's doing is they're giving you those immunoglobulins. They're giving you those antibodies so that you can fight that infection and kind of already have the blueprint for what you need to do. That's how our acquired immunity works. Acquired immunity is the development of antibodies against a pathogen we can do that actively by being exposed to the pathogen, or we can do that passively by receiving immunoglobulins, either from our mother's breast milk or from an immunoglobulin injection. Oh, that's another, a really cool example of that is when there was the Ebola scare in 2014 and everybody thought we were all gonna die of Ebola because, you know, we watched idea number one um when they brought some of the uh people that had become infected some of the uh, healthcare workers that had been in the hot zones dealing with the um, outbreaks they brought them back to the u.s for treatment at grady or was it grady or emory emory excuse me they they were doing the treatment at emory uh when they brought them back for that treatment they were not giving the patients a vaccine, okay? There, there is no vaccine per se. But what they had found was that some of the healthcare providers that had been exposed and then had healed, or had, you know, they had been infected, they'd been contagious, they, they had the full-blown disease, but they were able to get over it and heal. They had developed antibodies within their blood plasma. And so what the treatment that was being done was they were doing blood plasma transfusions from the um, person who had been exposed and developed those antibodies to the person who had been exposed and had an infection and hadn't developed the antibodies and they were doing that direct transfusion. And that's why a few people were able to be brought here to, the, to Emory and treated and then healed. And people were all like, well, why are we treating them and not doing the same thing for everybody in the outbreak zones? And, not, and um, what was it? The, uh, oh, there were so many different, uh, there were a number of different nations in the area uh, in, the, um, in the hot zone at the time. But anyway, why weren't we doing that? Well, because we didn't have a vaccine. And the guy, the literal one guy who they had found the antibodies in only has so many units of blood Right, so they can't just drain all its blood and give it to the entire population of like four uh, West African nations. Like that, you know, that's not effective. But he, w they were able to help treat a few of those nurses and doctors with that method. So that that's another example of a passively acquired immunity. They were giving his antibodies to these uh, patients so that they could help fight it. All right, somebody just asked me a question about, let's see. Crystal said, what about bot flies? What's your take on how that and how it affects the body? Bot flies are parasitic, and you, I believe you're referring to the fact that when they, um, they enter our bloodstream in, um, in something we eat, um, in basically like a capsule or a um, larval state, and then they find their way through our intestines into our bloodstream. They find skin tissue, muscle tissue, where they start to grow um, because they feed off a of muscle tissue, and then they make their way to the skin surface and um, cut a little hole and leave, right? And that's where we call wolf worms, right? If you've ever had animals, at uh you know pets or whatever that's a wolf worm you know, horses cows get them and that's that's how that process works um so that being a parasite more so than a bacterial infection is a completely different uh, response um very that that that's um 
a lot harder for our body to respond to. I'm not certain if I answered your question completely or satisfactory. Okay. All right, so remember how I mentioned a minute ago, Bacteria enters our body, our body starts an attack to it. That is our primary response. We've never been exposed to this antigen. We create a primary response to it. And um, the macrophages, or well, not so much the macrophages, the monocytes, but, you, but more so there's cells that are called dendritic cells will, um, they basically go full Mad Max on the bacteria, they enter the area, they consume the bacteria, they tear the bacteria to pieces, and then they take chunks of the bacteria wall and post it on the outside. They stick it all around the outside of the bacteria, okay? So kind of like in the Mad Max movies where you see the crazy people running through the desert and they take their victims and they chop them to pieces and hang their heads and limbs and all that on the outside of their cars. Like that's what these uh, dendritic cells um, are doing and they tear the bacteria apart stick it on the outside of the cell and then they go back to the lymph nodes and at the lymph nodes they basically show up in the lymph nodes saying yeah look what we got look what we got and show that bacteria fragment to all of the other immature cells all the untyped cells within that um or non-specific they're, they're they're very much mature lymphocytes they just haven't been typed to a specific um pathogen right if you think of that whole, you know, Mad Max scene where they're like, ah, we brought our victim back, you know, like everybody's excited. Let's party. Um, you know, the headhunter scene from a, you know, a 60s or 70s movie. That's what these macro, these dendritic cells are doing. They're carrying that information back, showing it off to everyone else, saying all the other uh, lymphocytes saying, look for this, look for this, getting them all pumped up like it's a pep rally. And it takes a couple of days. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of action. And this is when you feel your sw uh, swelling of your lymph glands, whether you know they're, they're instead of scratch in your arm and so it's swelling in your armpit or you have a sore throat and it's swelling up here under your chin, wherever it happens to be, those are your lymph nodes creating an immune response. This is where the dendritic cells are pumping up all the B lymphocytes. Let's get going. And then all those B cells will go back out to wherever that target tissue is, wherever that infection is, and they will start dumping massive quantities of animal into that area. Now, that will also bring in macrophages. The macrophages are the phagocytes. There's going to still be some monocytes and all that, but the macrophages just go berserk eating up all of this bacteria. And the antibodies help attract the bacteria, um, will help tag the bacteria. They collapse or um, entrap it so it can't move away. It can't release its protective um, coatings and things like that, basically improving the chances of the macrophages of being able to consume and destroy all the bacteria. And that's how the infection works. And this takes a couple of days. And that's why that first infection, you might be contagious before you show symptoms because the symptoms, the fever, the aches and pains and all that kind of stuff, that's all your body fighting it, right? The bacteria, the virus probably doesn't give you a fever. It probably doesn't give you aches and pains, not for a long time. But that, or that, those symptoms are the inflammatory response of you attacking it, of you getting ready. Basically, the those are the uh, what's the called um, the drums of war, or you know however you want to um, think of it, the, the the furnaces of war. That's your body going on the war path, and then um, once the infection is over. You're gonna have you're gonna be super hungry because you've burned up a whole bunch of metabolism, you've burned up a whole bunch of energy stores, and now you gotta complete those stores. And you were body was so busy fighting the infection while you were sick, you didn't have any interest in eating. So now you've got to replace all those nutrients that were lost and consumed. Basically, kind of after a nation goes to war, there's a bit of a recession afterwards as they're trying to like 
figure everything out after all of their resources that were depleted. So that's why you tend to be pretty hungry right after a, um, an infection. Now, the next time you get exposed to that same pathogen, you have what's called the secondary response. Now, remember those B lymphocytes I saw that they got all pep rallied up and hyped up to go out and fight the enemy and release all of their antibodies? Some of those as they are being typed, they're going to turn into plasma cells. The plasma cells are what releases the antibodies. Some of them get turned into what's called memory B cells. And those memory B cells will retain those antibodies, and they basically keep a, uh, a running tally of all of the different types of, ana of pathogens. And so now they're out circulating their... Um, monitoring for any future invasion and then when a new invasion is found of the same bacteria they're quick to recognize it quick to type against it they release um their antibodies and trigger at a response of m other memory b cells replicating and splitting into um more plasma cells and so instead of having the dendritic cells and the pep rally and the the lymph node inflammation and swelling you're not really going to see that on the second exposure because the plasma cell, the b cells already have the data they already have what they need and they just go full combat mode replicating plasma cells and dumping antibodies and your body will fight off that infection without you even knowing you were exposed because you'll never have the symptoms on that second um, exposure. So that's kind of the basics between the primary and secondary is why the first time you feel sick and it's crappy, the second time you, um, you're exposed, you don't even know you were exposed, just fall off. And you're like, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got the flu which by the way is a virus, not a bacteria, but very still very similar processes that we're dealing with here, just for legal purposes. You got the flu, you felt sick, whatever, you got over it in a couple of days. This was in September, the, October, beginning of flu season, probably around the end of October when you happened to be eating a whole lot of candy for some reason, and had a depressed immune system, well, wait, 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 wait. You know, all right. So you get the flu, you get over it, no big deal. You go to Thanksgiving with your friends down the street, you watch football, everything's fine, nobody gets sick, everything's great, right? Christmas comes around and all of a sudden, people are getting flu again, you get the flu again, now you're really sick and you're like, wait a minute, why didn't I have a secondary response? Why did I get the flu twice? Good question. You got exposed to a flu virus that was indigenous to your area. It was endemic, it was local, right? Typed, you had a primary response, you had your antibodies, you were ready to go. At Thanksgiving, you were exposed to it again by friends coming over your house, but they had all been exposed to the same one, so it was the same virus strain. You were good. You had a secondary response, you never even knew you were exposed, everything was fine. But when Christmas came around and you got exposed again, this time you were not being exposed to the Georgia flu. You were being exposed to the Michigan or the New York flu that somebody from up there thought they needed to come down here to see their family and brought that flu strain with them. Even though it might still be listed, oh, that's flu A or flu B. Yeah, probably. But it's a slightly different mutation, a slightly different strain. And so your antibodies from your primary response aren't the same and so that's why you got infected again this is the same concept for why a person might get the um flu vaccine but then still acquire the flu later in the season because the flu vaccine is designed to process or to protect you to protect you it's designed to expose you to eight different generally roughly so like or very some, but you know, they six to eight different viral strains, and they look for the strains that they think are going to be most likely to um, propagate in the um, regionally. Create that vi vaccine and ship it out, and then hope that those are the strains. Well, if there's mutations, if there's different strains that show up, that's when problems arise, and that's why was it twenty. 17 or 18 i can't remember which year it was it was like basically everybody who was getting the flu left and right really bad because um and it was determined and admitted later that the flu vaccine um 
was effect was basically ineffective that year because it had been um, typed to virus strains that really didn't go anywhere. Um, they they hadn't been the ones that were predicted to be big. So a lot of people were getting sick. So that's how that that concept works. Um, with the primary versus secondary, and then you have to worry about the viral um, mutation and change. Bacteria, on the other hand, while they do mutate and they do change, their mutations have more to do with their resistance abilities and not so much their um, antibody identity. So the antibodies, even as the bacteria, like E. coli is E. coli is E. coli. Antibodies for E. coli are going to recognize it pretty much no matter what. But what will change is you might have, here's an E. coli that's resistant to penicillin, but then you have this E. coli that's only resistant to um, cephalosporin. And then here's this E. coli, and it's only resistant to methicillin. And it's, uh, and, but now it's resistant to methicillin. And it, it, here's this E. coli, and now it's resistant to VRE, or not VRE, um, vancomycin. And so you have these different levels of antibiotics. The bacteria is changing and developing resistance to that. And um let me show you a quick youtube video on that and then we'll go on break there we go okay so the immune response here we can see how antibodies play a role in our immune response i was talking about some of these terms late earlier so maybe this will help um visualize that process all right so the antigen and the antibody Show up right the antigen is whatever the problem was right the bacteria the virus the peanuts the whatever you know whatever entered the body that's not supposed to be there the body's like oh we don't like you here's an antibody that you uh that is specific to you and they bind together forming the complex and so that's where you can see the antigen antibody complex now, within that, you can have a few different responses. First, it could become the com complement activation, or it can become one of the other three options. And they kind of go in those uh, three directions there. The complement activation will, is, as you can see, the antibody basically changes a um, the pumps on the bacteria's cell wall and starts allowing sodium and potassium to move into the cell, which pulls water with it that swells the cell and basically bursts. So as you can see, the complement system activates kind of this self-destruction process and those cells will then become cell particulate and that cell particulate is easily phagocytized by the um, macrophages and the monocytes right so they're already dead when they're being eaten now the other option with your um antigen antibody complexes are these three the precipitation agglutination and the neutralization all right so precipitation is what you're going to see when you have like viruses or a real um, toxins like bee venom or peanut um proteins and things like that stuff that's very small much much smaller than a bacteria so there's no cell wall for it to uh, be to have activated and it's also so, so small that it's unlikely that a white blood cell, a macrophage, would be able to identify it and phagocyze it. So the um, precipitation is going to bind all of the little particulate together into larger clumps that make it easier for a... Um, phagocyte to come along and collect it it's kind of like if you've ever had a had to work with cleaning a pool or a pond or whatever where you put a chemical called a flocculant into it you, it's uh basically it makes a, like a clarifier if you've ever seen like on a um swimming pool kit or a spa um 
hot tub kit or something like that they sell products called clarifiers you're supposed to pour it in and it makes the water not cloudy well what it does is it takes all the little fine bacterial or algae particulate that's in the water collects it together in big clumps and then those big clumps are heavy enough to sink to the bottom so they can be cleaned out and vacuumed out um so if that's what precipitation is now agglutination is a little bit different but it's still the same concept but agglutination is where larger cells in this case you can see white blood or red blood cells because that would happen during a transfusion reaction agglutination is the cells get bound to other um cells via these antibodies these antibodies are holding everybody together making larger clumps and those larger clumps are no longer able to cause problems because the cells have been basically stagnated of course that could cause a really big problem if it's red blood cells in your bloodstream but that makes it easier for phagocytosis to happen because it gets identified as here problem is um it think of it kind of like a crowd control where the um they're just bringing in the gate the fences to say all right we're going to hold you in this area we're not actually arresting you we're not moving you we're just squeezing you into this area and sequestering you with the um crowd control fences that way um yeah that's agglutination you're just being bound together into the same area to keep them from doing something the last thing that a um antibody might do is called neutralization and there might be antibodies for all of these things happening at the same time neutralization is some bacteria will release toxins like i mentioned earlier the botulism problem um it comes from a bacteria botul uh there is a bacterium that does that but it releases a toxin the botulinum toxin and that toxin is what makes a, a which was what can poison you and such so a lot of other bacteria and substances release these toxins and antibodies can actually bind to those toxins because they're often protein based of some sort and so the antibodies bind to it by binding to it it prevents that toxin from being able to harm your tissue because it's been removed and then the antibodies are quickly recognized by the macrophages and phagocytes. So as you see, the complement system does not result in phagocytosis until after the cell has died, but all the others are either just little particles being clumped together into big particles, cells being clumped into uh, groups that can are no longer harmful, uh, or the uh, byproducts of bacteria being neutralized and then all of those going to phagocytosis. So, questions on that? How are you feeling on that topic? Um, clear as mud, or are, were you following that explanation? You guys are sleep. What's that? I didn't hear you say that again. So so. Okay. Well, we're gonna keep. We'll Yeah, sure. Gotcha. All right. So this is showing how antibodies work. All right. So the antibody, and, and we're going to deal with more, but a minute ago, I was talking about your primary and secondary immune responses. This is how the antibodies work within that immune response. Um, so the antibodies will bind to the bacteria, the virus, whatever it is, and form one of these four complexes, which will then result ultimately in phagocytosis because the bacteria is destroyed or whatever it happens to be because different organisms will respond differently so um and th and this is how but ultimately antibodies in one way shape or form assist in the destruction as you can see in all of these situations none of the targets have been destroyed by the antibody in the complement system the antibody makes it possible for the the bacteria to be destroyed in precipitation it binds it together to make it notable and you know noticeable by the phagocytes and agglutination it it uh, corrals them together so that they can't go anywhere 
to the, for agglutination person or for um, phagocytosis, and then neutralization, it just does that. It stops the chemical from being the poison from being poisonous, getting it ready for phagocytosis. So those are ultimately antibodies lead to phagocytosis, but phagocytosis is what removes the bacteria, destroys it, gets rid of it, it's gone. Now, immunogens, these are anything that enters our body that causes an immune response, all right? So this, like we said before, proteins from peanuts. It could be the um, a virus, a bacteria, a fungus. Um, foreign tissue cells. Immunogens are just something that causes an immune response. Now, a haptin, we're not actually going to get too worried about that, but haptins are a generally a chemical structure, often like an oil or something, that is not actually an immunogen. But when it binds to the organic matter on our cells, it creates a haptin cell complex, and that new complex is actually an immunogen which is what poison ivy is, for example. Here in Georgia, we seem to get it a lot, so if you run into it, you're not actually an allergic reaction. The immunogen, what is going, or the haptin, it, the oil, binds to your cells on your skin, and that new complex is what triggers an immune response, which is why um, the skin doesn't itch immediately. It takes a little time because the itching and all that, the blistering and everything, that is an autoimmune. That's essentially an autoimmune. Technically, you know, it, a new product, it's a new complex, but that's your immune system attacking that tissue and trying to destroy it. Um, and then for folks who are like, oh, I get systemic um poison ivy i get it on my hand and then it's all over my body that's because that immune response is getting out of control it's like an uh, over aggressive response you know kind of the difference between an allergic reaction from a bee sting and an anaphylactic reaction from a bee sting you know the difference between a localized poison ivy versus a systemic poison ivy. Now, some people are significantly sensitive to it so that like the oils that are coming out of the smoke of poison ivy when it's being burned, you know, that gets in their lungs and all over their body, then that's just that's all it takes for them to start the response. So that's a little different. So, all right. So we talked about primary and secondary exposure. Remember, primary is the first time you get it and you've got to go through this really long pathway in order to type antibodies and, and make antibodies to attack this invading substance. The secondary response is you've already got antibodies stored somewhere in a memory cell and those memory cells can instantly start replicating and producing new antibodies without a larger process. So, both of those process procedures are headed towards getting us antibodies in the bloodstream. And so this is what we can see here in this image. It's at the very top, the um, cells are just B lymphocytes. These B lymphocytes are going to be uh, floating around in our bloodstream. These are like the dendritic cells that I mentioned earlier. Um, they have very similar functions and things like that. Very, very, very similar. They're looking for antibodies. And when they find this new antibody and they've typed it to the outside, basically they're made with like every possible variation of protein binding connection points to see if something, they'll ever run into something that happens to bind to that. And that's what an antibody is, is it's just a little protein control marker that, um, you know, it might be, it, it you know, in drawings, people like to draw them as a curve shape or as a um, V shape or as a square shape or, you know, it's just to depict it, but it's protein binding or chemical binding sites that are looking for very specific chemical patterns or, you know, molecular patterns. And these lymphocytes, these B lymphocytes, they have tons of these binding sites on them trying to basically be ready for anything they find. Then they find something, it's reacting, they take that back to the lymph node, and in the lymph node they find all the lymphoblasts. These lymphoblasts are mature but not specific cells. Those 
turn into where you get the memory cells and the plasma cells. And you can see the pattern here where the B lymphocytes, they bring the antigen to the uh, lymphoblasts, the lymphoblasts start replicating, and your result are these plasma cells. These are antibody producing cells. These plasma cells are basically massive antibody factories. And they go to wherever the cell, the invasion, wherever the infection is, and start dumping antibodies like nobody's business. They just flood the area with antibodies. And then sometimes a memory B cell is made and kept. Now that memory B cell, as you can see in the secondary response further down the slide, that memory B cell um, already knows what that antibody, um, that uh, pathogen is. And that pathogen, um, or so when that pathogen shows back up, those memory B cells instantly start replicating and making new plasma cells and new memory B cells. And so they go, they avoid the whole lymphoblast process and the typing in the uh, lymph nodes and all that kind of stuff. It just immediately starts pumping out new plasma cells to make new antibodies. And that's why you don't have to have the fever. So that's the difference between the primary and the secondary response. I didn't hear you say that again. Did you ask me a question? Guess not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, every now and then I get a little pop-up on my screen that says, your connection is unstable. And I'm like, well, then give it some freaking Prozac because I don't have the memory or I don't have the emotional capacity to deal with the internet connections problems. Like, just get your act together and do your job. I'm sorry. And then the problem that I get is my stream, my, like, like my view of the camera doesn't change. So I don't get the freeze, like you, you're not hearing me. And then, okay, now you can hear me. I, I don't know that. So I don't know when to stop and when to pick back up, so. All right, so primary response marauding B lymphocytes, all right? Marauding B cells. They're just out there looking for trouble, trying to see if they can find anything wrong. Think of them as sentries, think of them as scavengers, whatever you want to come up with. You know, I like to use the scavenger idea in the, the Mad Max movie. They're out there looking for trouble. They find something, they tear it apart, they bring it back back to the lymph node, they bring it back to the base, and they take all of the ready to fight lymphoblasts and type them to plasma cells and they are ready for war. And then plasma cells get dumped into your body on the war path and start blasting away with antibodies until the invasion or whatever this object is gone, right? Whatever this specific antigen is is destroyed but the diff next time for a secondary response those memory cells those um plasma producing cells they're already or well, not plasma producing but they are uh, antibody producing plasma cells they're already out there per marauding now instead of just having scouts out there it's like having a full um raiding party 
out marauding around looking for that same infection that same pathogen again and then when that pathogen shows up they instantly replicate and surround and destroy instead of having to go back to base and get reinforcements and all that kind of a thing they have the ability to generate their own reinforcements on site All right, um, yes, we talked about that. Um, all right, this is also showing another um, example of, or another ex um, explanation for activation in T lymphocytes. Um, to, be, to be honest, I don't really want to dive into the activation too much. Activation in T cells gets really, um, mm, this is where it starts to get really conf confusing, but um, T cells and B cells have similar functions, or not similar functions. They have similar purposes, but they do it in a different way. B lymphocytes make antibodies. T lymphocytes attack cells, all right? So when you have a invasion with something small, um like viruses your antibodies are going to get really aggressive to that uh, but if that virus gets into cells and starts replicating within a cell or causing the cell to build new viruses or the bacteria is really strong or whatever the um or large bacteria and things the t cells are actually the ones that come in and destroy individual cells. So whereas a lymphocyte will send out antibodies and the antibodies send out, uh, destroy the cell, the T cells um, show up, bind to the complex and basically deposit a bomb in that cell and cause it to be destroyed. Um, I think a good example of that would just kind of like in a um you know like a war like a sci-fi war movie or whatever when the the submarine like or the spaceship comes up to the mothership type thing and it connects to it and it places the bomb on it and then it releases and moves away and then that bomb goes off and boom the the big ship is gone that's what T cells do and the T cell binds to the cell activates it sets off the bomb and then releases and then that's that target cell is destroyed whereas the b cells they just make the antibodies and the antibodies uh target for are uh create the target for destruction So remember, T cells go straight to cell attack, whereas B cells make the antibodies. And so we will call B cells, that's the humoral immune response. Does anybody know why it's called humoral immune response? Okay. What does humor? Anybody have connection or like a memory? What like what does humor make you think of? Okay, yeah. So the humerus is a bone. Humor is also a way of making uh, of coping with our. Uh, Dis, uh, disturbing job at times but humor was a word used in old old medicine years ago as the fluids within the body a humor was a fluid and we there was believed that there were like the four humors and they had to be balanced a certain way and this is where the ideas of like bloodletting came from like oh you're you're sick you have too much of the humor so we have to let some of it go and that you know that's why we oh look they're not crazy anymore because well probably because they're anemic shock because you just bled them out but um anyway that is how um
that is how um, the name for fluids got called. Now, because antibodies are not cells, antibodies are released into liquid, they're released into our blood and they flow through the blood. Antibodies are the humoral response, the fluid response. Like it, the antibodies are not cells attacking the pathogen, they are particulate being carried in the blood to attack the pathogen. Whereas cellular response is where the T cell is directly attacking the invading cell or, or the abnormal cell, like a direct attack. Does that make, is that, are you following there? So earlier when we talked about the primary and secondary response, that is a humoral response. The humoral response is making antibodies. But, and, and that's one of our most common, most likely responses to foreign invasion. Cellular response comes a lot later in the process. Cellular response is after you have a heavy infection or lots of cells. So like cellular response is gonna be for viral infected cells or for cancer cells or for uh, heavily seeded bacterial infections. The antibodies process that we talked about with a complement and agglutination and uh, precipitation, that's all what do the antibodies do once they find their target. All right, so um, the helper T cells, I'm not gonna dig into them. If you're curious, helper T cells do what they say. They help. They bind to another cell and basically pump it full of energy, give it the energy to do what it needs to do, or in another, and in some cases, actually, um, they're the safeguard that, like, let's say a killer T cell shows up and says, um, I'm going to kill you. It can't actually bind and kill the cell until the hel helper T cell also binds and says, yes, this is confirmed. You know, kind of think the, the war movie with the sniper and the spotter and the sniper's like, oh, I got him in my sights. I'm ready to pull the trigger. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And the spotter's like, wait, wait, hang on. I got to confirm. All right, we're confirmed. You're clear to shoot. Take the shot. Like that's what the helper T cells do to help um, allow the B cells and the T cells to So this is a picture like a um kind of a description of how and of what an antibody looks like. You can see the one at the top is an ID IgG antibody. It's a type G immunoglobulin, Ig immunoglobulin, and then type G. So immunoglobulin G or immunoglobulin M. Um, immunoglobulin Gs are the ones that we see most with um, anaphylaxis and such like that. Immunoglobulin N, if I remember right, handles more like bacterial infections or I think A is the one that handles blood um, transfusion problems. Um, but you can see how the antigen binds, how it has a very specific binding site. It's made special to bind to that one specific antigen. But that's why immuno immunoglobulins for one um, bacteria or virus might work on another one because they had similar binding sites. This would be why, for example, several hundred years ago, a random farmer who apparently was a lot smarter than most people thought, discovered that there was a way to prevent infection and death from smallpox. He noticed, and this is in 1748, he noticed that a person who had had cowpox, cowpox is a slight, very, slightly different variation of the same in, uh, type of virus, a person who had cowpox never died of smallpox. So he took scrapings of the pus and the pustules, I should say, on a, of cowpox, on a cowpox victim, and placed them on his kids. His kids became infected with cowpox. 
They quickly over, over, uh, recovered from it, no problem. They were then, because of good grief, it was England in 1748. Like, what did you think was going to happen? They got exposed to smallpox. Pox was everywhere. They got, they barely got sick at all, um, and um, had no issue. So he continued to do this experiment over and over again, and they realized, hey, if you're exposed to cowpox, you get a minor infection, no big deal prevents you from becoming infected with cowpox because the antigens were on both of those pox viruses were very similar. So the antibodies worked. And that introduced the concept of inoculation and immunization to let's expose you intentionally to a low level infection in order to protect you from a high level infection. And so uh, vaccines were invented and actually to this day a similar style exposure method is used with a cow with um uh, smallpox vaccines let me show you this a uh, oops wrong wrong tab All right, so when you're giving the smallpox vaccine, you don't use a syringe and a normal uh, hypodermic needle with the hole in the middle. You use this. It's called a bifurcated needle, and it looks like a fork. Very sharp. Um, I took a class one time where we learned to, no, not uh, where we learned how to um, give the smallpox vaccine. You take this little needle here, and you dip it into the um, word I'm looking for. Dip it into the uh, vial of vaccine, and then you sit there and just stab the patient's arm like 10 times in a row with it. It makes very little pinprick abrasions on the skin surface. It doesn't go very deep at all. Um, it is just the very tips of the pin there, but it abrades the skin enough that that viral, or excuse me, that vaccine liquid will then dump uh, or absorb into the tissue that way. So here you can see a, uh, a you know, an ex example of how it's done. You just hold the skin like that and sit there and pop, 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 pop it into their skin. And that is the, uh, that is how to immunize against smallpox. And then the person will develop a sore. This is a example of what those pox will look like um, because you can, um, see here at day four, you have two little pox developing um, where the incision was, and then day seven, so on and so forth. And if here's the, a little bit scary aspect of the smallpox vaccine, it is an attenuated virus. It is a virus that has been essentially paralyzed. But if somebody touches this festering wound while you're typing you know during this time period especially between day uh four and day 14 you know by the time you're getting out there to day 21 it's starting to dry up and no longer be a concern but when it's growing there from 7 to 14 that is um they could actually get live active smallpox you have to protect that um insertion site that injection site during that um typing process the person the that was vaccinated they won't get it but if anybody touches that and the virus moves from that to somebody else they would have wild you know, uh smallpox they would have full-blown smallpox um smallpox is whoops wrong tab um Smallpox has been known or determined to only exist within the human population. Um, it is not able to be carried uh, by any animal that we know of. And for that reason, our vaccination methods have eradicated it in, um, in the wild. The only known locations of smallpox are in um, laboratory facilities where the where strains have been kept um in cryo but 
smallpox i think the last case in the u.s was in the 70s and the last case worldwide was in the 90s um so smallpox has been essentially um eradicated for that purpose the reason things like coronaviruses or maybe you've maybe you've heard of monkeypox recently the reason monkeypox virus will never be eradicated like smallpox it's a sl it's it's basically smallpox but a little less deadly it, 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 well not a little bit it, it's less deadly it's less virulent it's less likely to spread and it doesn't have near as high of likelihood of killing you uh, or making you severely sick like smallpox does so a little safer but the reason we'll never get rid of it is it's easily carried in primates primates are hosts therefore we can't vaccinate all the primates in the um, congo jungle so you're never going to be able to get rid of it because it will always be carried by animals and as soon as those human animals come in contact with each other it'll it could be passed along so that's that's one of the issues with various uh diseases similar with polio yeah we were able to control polio because polio wasn't carried by other uh, organisms other um mammals more or reptiles or whatever so it's kind of how that works so it's very specific so here you go you can see the immunoglobulins that's what we've been talking about these are the antibodies and so your cells are going to produce these to attack or to neutralize the invading organism or you could get an injection of these in order to protect you against invading organisms uh, not going to worry about this. Isotypic, allotypic, idiotypic, not going to worry about it. Don't, don't dig into that very much. Um, this is that whole thing that I was pointing out earlier where we were talking about the um, agglutination or precipitation or uh, neutralization. So um, opsonization is kind of like the, um, the tagging them that I was talking about. They, they, bind to it and then the bacteria or the macrophage comes along and says yep i'm gonna eat that because it looks tasty it's like taking um dry toast and covering it with butter and cinnamon sugar and now it looks tasty and now you want to eat it um could cause them to clump together which could be like taking a bunch of rice krispies that are all around laying in the bottom of a bowl and probably a pain in the butt to have to eat and then you just um dump some um melted marshmallows in it and mix it around and now it sticks together and so it's really easy for you to pick up and eat the marshmallow tree right so that that's what the antigens are clumping the bacteria or not the bacteria but the um the antibody together not the antibody the antigen right the antibodies clump the antigen together so that the bacteria the macrophages can eat it and then i already mentioned the toxins so those are the jobs of antibodies make it easier for things to eat them or uh neutralize it so they can't harm anything all right um i said igg was for anima or for anaphylaxis i was wrong it's ige g e yeah um so i messed up so ige is for anaphylaxis um igm is for blood um the iga is uh you're gonna find it in the blood but it's looking for um like bacteria and stuff so the igg is also going to be found floating around in the blood this is a vi and my internet's going cuckoo cuckoo all right am i back can you hear me got a break up okay. well just know it's not me it's them okay i'm not breaking up with you There we go. Immunoglobulins. Questions on immunoglobulins and antibodies.
But we kind of looked at the same thing several times now. We're going to keep talking about it. Like it, the PowerPoint was designed to kind of go big picture and then let's like get more specific where I'm just kind of going like, here it is, here it is again, here it is again. Hopefully you'll start hearing it. Now we're going to about to move from humoral immunity into cellular, cell mediated immunity or cellular immunity. Do you guys need a brain break? I'm seeing some nodding and I'm seeing some blank stares and that tells me you need a brain break. So take a quick brain break. All right, so um, moving on to the cell-mediated immune response. All right, what cells did I say handle cell-mediated responses? I, di I didn't hear you, and unfortunately, both of them sound very similar. So, I do so they're the T cells, the T lymphocytes, like the killer T cells. So, if you think about it this way, the B cells they're the um, they're the ones that make the hum the antibodies, right? They release the antibodies, and the antibodies go do their thing, the plasma cells. But the T cells they are the killer cells that kill cells right they're going to actually connect to infected cells viruses fungi parasites bacteria the these and then kill those directly versus releasing the b cells that release the antibodies okay so the antibodies do the killing but the t cells they kill they directly impact the cell so cell to cell connection and they literally do they connect they bind to it and detonate it so that's why we see them handling so many of these other types of infections that are virally, or excuse me, cellular-based organisms. Now, obviously, viruses are not a cell, but the rest of them are. So, all right. <clears throat> this is also how we reject organs, right? So somebody gets a liver transplant, then what do they get put on? Or, you know, kidney transplant, liver get, transplant, what happens to them? Yep, they're on anti-rejection meds for the rest of their life. And that is to suppress the T cell response so the T cells don't ac uh, accidentally, well, not accidentally, but intentionally destroy that transplanted liver now uh, or organ. The same thing happens with HIV, which HIV is a virus, AIDS is a, is a syndrome. The HIV virus destroys T cells so that they can't fight these infections or these invasions, and so they suppress the immune system that way. So, um, yeah. So we have the killer T cells, the helper T cells, the suppressor. Uh, the suppressor T cells are kind of like um, the handlers of the T cells. If you think of the T cells as the attack dogs or the the, the hunter killers, the, the ones that are gonna go out there and do the destroying, the suppressor T cells are the one, and you can't hear me. Tell me when you can hear me. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, okay. All right. So when the the killer T cells go berserk and destroy things, the suppressor T cells, they're the ones that come in and say, okay, that's enough. Stop. You've done your job. They prevent the killer T cells from going um, full rampage throughout the body, which is part of what happens when you have autoimmune system or autoimmune disorders like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or ulcerative colitis or um, Crohn's or um, any of those kind of scenarios where your immune system is attacking your own tissue because your suppressor T cells are not working properly. And so your um, T cells are destroying things without being placed in check, all right? The memory T cells, they, I think that makes sense, all right? So, um, yeah, those are what our T cells are going to do.
and there are all those different jobs so um now before i go further let's watch and this and what we're going to do is this will change into the inflammatory response and we're going to move away from the immune into inflammatory so what i want to do is show you a quick uh well yeah it's like a 10 minute video by um on youtube that kind of takes everything we just talked about with the immune system and animates it so that we can uh See it put together. So stand by. video yep this is the correct one all right um pause it or, okay good so you saw how there was the invasion you saw how the uh, macrophages can uh, destroy things but sometimes they're not good enough or to uh, enough to based on the invasion so they bring in additional help you saw how the helper t cells help activate cells and then in the dendritic cells took the information back to the um, helper t cells and typed other cells so then you had your plasma cells and the antibodies then you had the helper b cells come in and give it more energy so that it doesn't wear out but then once the um, suppressor cells come in and it says, you know what, the battle's over, the, B the helper B cells stop helping, um, they stop pushing the, um, the attack, and then all of your um, plasma cells and your monocytes and macrophages, they all like give up and the killer cell, the, the, the battle is over. The... Um, and the damage are um and so in order to stop burning up bodily uh body resources it resets so which type of immunity hand uses antibodies do what But what do we call what do we call that immune process? It the, the it is the humoral immunity. Antibodies use humoral uh, are used in the humoral immunity response. What are some of the things that a um, what are some of the things that antibodies do? All right, what are, what are some of those functions that we we discussed that antibodies do? Okay. Yep. They bind to it so that other cells can attack it and uh, consume it. Yep. What are some other things they do? That's more your health, your memory B cells that have the antibodies attached or that have similar complexes attached to them, not so much the actual an uh, antibodies themselves. Uh, so the antibodies are kind of just inert. So they will bind to a bacteria to tar uh, tag it for consumption, for destruction. They will take small toxins 
and c combine them together so that, that they're a larger substance that a bacteria can, or that the uh, macrophages can destroy, or they will uh, trigger the bacterial wall to become porous and allow the cell to destroy itself. And that's pretty much your, your process there. Then tag them for destruction, bind all the little pieces together, destroy the, um, what I'm looking for, destroy the cell wall or t cause the cell wall to be um, broken down and destroyed or neutralize the toxins that are being released by the bacteria. So the, that is what humoral immunity and um, antibodies will do. Now, what does the cell-mediated cell immunity do? Yes. Yep, those are the T cells. And what do T cells, what is their process, like the killer T cells, what are they going to do? Yes, yes, they destroy on contact. They will target cells, whether that's your tissue cells, cancer cells, bacteria, parasites, viruses, um, foreign tissue, you know, organ transplant tissue, all of those things, they will destroy um, T cells destroy on contact. So there's uh, direct cell to cell uh, destruction. So moral immunity uses antibodies as the intermediate step, whereas cellular immunity is the cell itself destroying it. Um, and that's what's the difference between natural immunity and acquired immunity? Yes. Acquired, you have to be exposed to something. What is natural? Yeah. Natural is based on the um, immune or the inflammatory response system. This is something that your body doesn't have to have anything specific for. Um, it has, it's very effective, but it is not. Um, unique to uh, the problem. And so within your acquired immunity, what are the two types of acquired immunity that you can come up with? Mother, okay, yeah, the mother to child has acquired immunity. That's called passive acquired immunity. What are you receiving? What is the child receiving from the mother? Antibodies, yes. So passive acquired immunity is whenever antibodies are being transferred into the body so that you don't have to create them. They're, they're being given to you. The infant doesn't have the ability to create antibodies, so antibodies are transferred via the breast milk. And when you're going into an area that has known illnesses in indigenous there uh, or endemic there, you don't want to have to get that illness and create a response. So you're given antibodies so that you're pr protected against it. Active acquired immunity is when you are exposed to a um, version of the pathogen, whether that's the actual live uh, bacteria or virus, or if it's a um, fragments of it, you know, protein-based vaccine of some sort. Anyway, you are exposed to a substance and your body um, actively acquires a resistance to it. And that can meet, and we talked about that with like cowpox versus smallpox or a flu vaccine or something like that. So, um... All right, what's the difference between a primary response and a secondary response when we get down into the um, 
We're talking about the humoral response and the immune system and how it re reacts when an invasion takes place. What's, what's a big difference between primary and secondary response? Secondary uses memory. Yes. Yes. But as you, the patient, as your body, what is something you will notice different between the two responses? Yeah, exactly. A primary response is going to take several days to reach viral um, antibody load. And you will have fever, aches, pains. You will have all of the inflammatory response trying to um, prepare or uh, ramp up your defenses against this invasion. A secondary response, because it's using the memory cells, it doesn't need to use your lymph nodes. It doesn't need to create this massive immune process with an inflammatory response. You don't get fever. You don't get the aches and pains. You simply start releasing antibodies and your body fights off the invasion and you don't even know it. So a primary response is slow and painful. A secondary response is quick and silent and effective. In a primary response, it could be three, four days to hit a uh, adequate or sufficient viral or um, antibody load. In a secondary response, you could be looking at eight hours, six to eight, 12 hours before you hit a um, effective uh, antibody load. And the antibody loads from the secondary response are through the roof compared to what you get from the primary response. Much more aggressive uh, attack in a secondary response. So those are your, um, that is the basic differences, fundamental things you need to understand between um, the, for the immune system between humoral and cellular immune system um, responses, natural versus acquired, uh, active acquired versus passive acquired, primary response and secondary response. Those are the kind of things that you want to know. Now, what we want to do is we're going to move into the inflammatory response and how the inflammation works and how that assists the immune system in the job of the immune system and how some of the functions of the immune system are, um, excuse me, how some of the functions of the inflammatory response are going to um, assist the immune system or, or just straight up prevent the infection in the first place. So that'll be the next section. But before we get into that, let's go ahead um, and break for lunch and we'll plan to come back at 12.50. Talking about the immune response, um, the humoral versus cellular uh, immune response, but this inflammatory response do, uh, works pretty much the same way for anything. Um, it's not, going to be cell or humoral specific. This is going to be, and this doesn't actually just work for bacteria or fungus or virus. This is going to work for trauma of any type, basically any alteration of tissue function or injury to tissue function. So, These are the cardinal signs of inflammation. We talked about this the other uh, the other day briefly. We mentioned that you have the pain, swelling, redness, and heat. I think the chart that we looked at included the difference between pain and tenderness. Um, I think it's hard to like what what's what classifies tenderness and what classifies pain. Um, I'm not going to try to give you that answer, but the way I look at it is if it hurts, it's pain. But if it hurts when you touch it, it's tender. Does does that make sense? It's it's not a it, it's kind of like a lower level pain, but it doesn't really hurt until you've touched it. Um so 
Why, where does this come from? All right, so we have acute inflammation versus chronic. We're, we're going to be focusing more on acute, but the chronic uses similar processes, all right? So... There are cells in part of the immune system that are involved in the inflammatory process, but they're very generic. They're not specific to the infection, all right? Uh, hypermia, what does that mean? What is that? Let's break that word down. Okay, all right, you're actually, the, it's funny your your connection with the words that are not correct, but your end goal, like like the end product, was very very much the same, very close. All right, it's hyper, I H Y P E I hyper, so fast or increased, right? Emia fluid. All right, so hypermia is a quicker movement of f fluid, which actually is facilitated by ability and um so the high so that but it's the movement of fluids so um so but, i mean very very close great job breaking that word down oh thank you so much oh whew, blinded me over there mate uh, noonan um your lamp pointed right at me it was uh, it was hard to see you but that works all right um so what is hypermia? What are we talking about here? Remember my description of the nylons, like the nylon stockings, and how when you first take them out of the package, they're rather dark and you don't see a lot of light pass through them, but then when you stretch them, they look lighter even because the the um they go from being very closely packed or um aligned fibers to spaced out right they're stretched out spread out some more lights uh, move them that's what's going on with our blood vessels when the blood vessels are constricted they're very tight the cells are all close together and not much slips through but when the cells or when the vessels start to stretch and are become over inflated um, the cells are moving apart and that allows more room for water and other immune cells to pass through them that um causes fluid to leak interstitial we call that third spacing we see this with our um CHF patients who get pit pitting edema but this is why we get swelling around an injury site like a cut or a you know a bug bite or a um bruise or something it gets swollen because fluid has been released into that interstitial space so there's more fluid in that tissue making it tighter all right now um what also happens is the um Distal capillaries at the far end of the capillary bed will start to constrict. The vessels are um, reducing the flow of blood out of that area. So this is in the venous side. And then that venous redu uh, flow reduction increases pressure, the blood flowing, it's slowing down. Um, and so as that so that vessel spreads out more blood flow is able or more blood is able to leak out of it the distal capillary or distal veins on the other side of the capillary bed they constrict down all of this slows the blood flow the blood being slowed there's a really interesting uh process that whenever blood flow slows down white blood cells automatically move from the middle of the blood vessel where they're traveling to the walls of the blood vessel. Once they move to the walls, they actually trade places with the cell, the, the cells of the vessel wall. Um, it's a weird, like they literally meet up and then rotate around and pass through. So I always kind of imagined it kind of like those videos you see of a, um, octopus trying to squeeze off the boat to go back into the, the ocean and it like squeeze through, squeezes through this little tiny hole in the side of the boat and like jelly well 
I used to think that's what it was. Oh, they, the white blood cells, they just squeeze through a little hole. But no, no, they actually come up to the, to the cell wall and then trade places with the cell wall and move out in that manner. But anyway, that's how the inflammatory response starts. So the cell expands, blood flow slows, the um, white blood cells move to the sides of the wall, and then they trade places with the blood cell, the wall cells, and enter the interstitial space to go find the trauma. All right. Um, what types of cells are we going to see in that tissue? Well, you're going to have the white um, white blood cells that we've already talked about, like the monocytes and the macrophages. You're going to have platelets. Why do we have platelets? What do platelets do? Yeah, they help build clots. So if there's trauma or something like that that's caused injury needs to be repaired, the platelets are going to help repair that. Um, with the production of clots and things those lines now what oops. all right um mast cells mast cells are cells that they're called granulocytes they have if you were to look at them under a microscope they look like they're full of little dots and that's basically a whole bunch of vacuoles that are full of histamines and leucines. so they're they are cells that are found in the tissue, connective tissues, so between the vessels and the dermis, and um, they're in your cartilage type tissues and um, the reticular connective tissue. Anyway, they are basically spread out through the tissue of your whole body. And they're just kind of sitting there like sentries. When there's an alarm that goes off in their area, when there's trauma, when there's an invasion, they activate and release their histamines and that's what attracts that's what allows the swelling to happen that's what starts the inflammatory process the plasma cells we already talked about that plasma cell b lymphocytes what do they do we mentioned those this morning Okay, so uh, that's the helpers, all right? The helper B cells, they do that. But the plasma cells, they're the ones that produce the antibodies. And if that's what you were saying the first time, you had gone digital and so I didn't catch it. So um, yeah, pl plasma B cells, they are what produce antibodies. Helper B cells are what keep everybody fighting and give them the energy and keep things moving. So the plasma B cells, they're producing antibodies. They come in, they start releasing those antibodies to target the invasion. So the chemical mediators, what's that talking about? Well, the big one there is histamine. There are other cytokines, that which cyto means cell, kines means messenger. So you have the histamines and cytokines, and then you have the leukotrienes, and the leukotrienes are a white blood cell, right? Leukocytes, white blood cell messengers. So um, that's that's the process that you're dealing with there. Um, so these are some of what's going on with acute inflammation. Where did I lose my mind? All right, there we go. Um, all right, degranulate, remove their granules. That's what I'm talking about. Mast cells, they are full of histamine packages, um, histamine bombs. If you have ever seen the pictures of like, the military c-130s or whatever when they dump or the videos of them when they dump all their flares at the same time like they're flying along and all of a sudden they just start blasting flares everywhere into this giant fireworks show behind them kind of think of that as your mast cells when they're, they're just patrolling they're just sitting in that uh tissue on lookout and then all of a sudden they recognize that there's trauma there's an invasion there's inflammation is needed they just start dumping histamines and cytokines into the tissue into the bloodstream they're just and that's like the effect of sounding the alarm um so what's going to cause this? Well, 
physical injury. Somebody walks up to you and punches you in the face. You're going to get swelling here because you're going to have the inflammatory response. Prime physical injury. Chemical agents. There are chemicals that are not necessarily going to cause trauma, but are going to um, stimulate the inflammatory response. Like, for example, if you had acid on your arm, it would burn. You would you would have direct chem, um, acid burn, like direct physical trauma physical injury. Well, other chemical agents, they are going to stimulate a response, maybe like an, an a immune type response, an inflammation response, but they aren't actually damaging your tissue cells per se. They're just stimulating the response. And then of course, anything immunologic. So you have an exposure to a, um, a bacteria, virus, fungi, you know, something along those lines, right? All right, so you also see the, it's talking about leukotrienes and prostaglandins. What are prostaglandins? Do you know? Prostaglandins are a chemical messenger that stimulates the, um, well, it helps work with the uh, sw swelling process and things like that, but they also trigger your um, pain responses. They're, 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 they will work with uh, stimulating that, but they'll also work with, uh, well, there's a certain amount of, we're not gonna get into the OB ones, like prostaglandins pay, play a big role in stimulating uh, delivery and stimulating the contraction of the uterus. But most of the time we see them indicating the need for additional resources in that area. They're like calling in for extra help. So. When you take a medication like Tylenol, it's a prostaglandin inhibitor. It's going to prevent the prostaglandins from att attracting additional fluid and pain sensation and such to that area. So you have a reduction in swelling, you have a reduction in the reaction. So prostaglandins will go to your brain and tell your brain, hey, there's an infection out here, we have a problem, we need a higher body temperature to fight this war. So the brain will increase your temperature. Well, a prostaglandin inhibitor like Tylenol will prevent that prostaglandin from getting to your brain and keep your temperature lower, right? It removes that stimulation to the brain. That's the most interesting. All right, sorry. So, moving forward. Now, I'm not going to to bore you to death. You're already like, then what the heck have you been doing? <laughs> I'm not going to bore you on this one, the plasma protein system. This is a very complex system. I do not understand it as well as I would like to. Um, but it's... Um, Suffice it to say, this is getting into the nitty gritty of how chemical mediators, chemical messengers attract white blood cells to the tissue and say, here's where the problem is. This is what you need to do. Start destroying. All right. So we have mast cells, basophils, which are white blood cells that float around in our blood. They do the same thing. But we have we have those granulocytes, they release these plasma protein uh, mediators, they, chemical, the chemical me messengers, they attract the white blood cells, the white blood cells do their job. We'll, we'll sum it up like that. Right, so there's the complement system, there's the coagulation system. The coagulation uh, cascades, there's two different ones, there's, um, intrinsic and the extrinsic the only thing you need to know is that extrinsic is really fast and intrinsic is really slow extrinsic is when there's an external damage to the cell to the vessels that prompts clotting clotting um cascades sometimes there's internal damage that isn't caused by direct like trauma and that's a slower cast clotting process We're gonna move past the kinnins. All right. Um, so, are you following me so far? 
inflammatory process is going to be started when trauma happens, chemical injury happens, or a bacterial pathogenic, not necessarily bacterial, but a pathogen uh, enters the tissue. Which cells sound the alarm? That's the prostaglandins are the messengers, but which cells release them? Those would be your mast cells. The mast cells are the lookout towers. They stand guard in the tissues of your body waiting for trauma or something to happen. So the mast cells, they are the ones that start the whole process. They degranulate, they release their contents, which is your prostaglandins, your leukotrienes, your histamines. And the histamines work really fast, the leukotrienes work really slow, and the prostaglandins are the ones that travel a long way to control like your body temperature and things like that, and pain sensation. So, um... Why, why is this going to work? Because you need an immune response, you need, or an inflammatory response, you need help in that part of your tissue. So, um, the mast cells set and send off the alarm, the histamines release, they dilate the blood vessels, the blood flow slows down, the white blood cells um, transfer to the side, to the walls, they move out of the cell cap, the vessels into the tissue and start looking for the problem. The other thing is the leukos, um, the prostaglandins and the um, leukotrienes, not the histamines. The histamines do a pretty good job of just dilating things. They're not really attracting, but the prostaglandins and the histamines, they're going to call in the reinforcements. They're going to say, hey, we need more uh, white blood cells in this area. Send in help. And so they're um, they're like the smoke signal sending up the flare, like bring in the, bring in the re uh, reserves. And then all of the additional white blood cells will flock to that area. And as you can see, they will Will, um, yeah, and that explains the extravascular versus intra intra the movement to the side of the vessel. That's the margination. Activation is when they go from being kind of in a um, safe resting phase to an active attack phase. Um, yep, transmigration is they're leaving the cell. That's what I was talking about. How they um trade places with the capillary cell wall and then you have the um hemotaxis is the movement of the white blood cell through the interstitial fluids and tissue to f to wherever the chemical is uh the chem the 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 incident is happening. So chemo taxes, it taxes is movement, chemo being chemical. So it's the movement based on the chemical. So they're attracted to the site of injury. All right. So now this power, or excuse me, this slide in your PowerPoint kind of takes the whole thing all the way to the bottom. And what you can see here is you start with the tissue injury, the tissue injury is going to cause the histamine and all that to be released that brings in the additional resources those resources uh you know the dilation of the capillaries the shifting of fluid out of the capillaries into the tissue and then the white blood cells will start consuming all the damaged um skin tissue or um the, all the damaged tissue cells it will remove all of the bacteria and think of it kind of like when 9-11 uh, happened, you know, they ultimately, like, we have we have a new World Trade Center, right? Well, before they could build anything, before they could build the memorial or what is it to call it? One World Tower? I don't remember. Anyway, before they could build it, they had to clear out all of the rubble. So the white blood cells do that too. They're not just looking for bacteria, they're also looking for damaged cells. So once they've cleaned all that out, then healing happens because new cells can start growing and that increased fluid um, blood flow to the area 
increases the um, concentrations of glucose and oxygen and proteins, other nutrients necessary to start replicating cells. So the white blood cells, they come in, they clean everything out. That's where you get your redness. That's where you get the heat because increased blood flow. You also get the pain and from the swelling, right? The tissue is being stretched. The joint hurts because there's more pressure in there. That's where a lot of that pain comes from, triggering the uh, nerve endings. And ultimately it all leads to healing. So that's how the inflammation process um, works through that. Now, here's a lot of the stuff I was talking about earlier, kind of digs it in, the cytokines I was talking about. We're going to move past that. These are specific, but these are not um, these are not real vital for you to know or understand, so don't stress on these. You know, it's like, are we going to attract this? Are we going to attract that? And they're, they're, they're chemical messengers, okay? That's what it is. They're chemical messengers that will attract what is needed to the site. <laughs> All right, so after this, we head into the section of in, um, tissue resolution and repair. So I know that has been a lot we've been talking about. The inflammatory process seems like this big, ugly animal, but we really don't need to be scared of it. It's not in, in its simple self mast cells release chemical messengers the chemical messengers dilate the blood flow the blood vessels and attract white blood cells dilated vessels allow white blood cells to leave and enter the tissue to clear out the debris and remove the harmful pathogens this allows tissue to start regrowing the dilated blood vessels and increased blood flow are what cause the heat the redness and the swelling and the swelling causes the pain because it puts pressure on the capillaries that increased blood flow provides the oxygen and nutrients needed for the cells to start rebuilding that's the inflammatory process we see that locally it's amazing it's incredible how we can heal when we see that globally it can become a real problem because that dilation of the capillaries if you double the size of the capillaries through the entire body suddenly you have not enough blood to fill them all and that's where we start running into issues with things like sepsis and anaphylaxis so this next segment is going to talk about how tissue healing happens and then what disease processes can prevent or inhibit tissue healing but before we go there let's take a quick break clear your heads wake up and refill your cups of water or coffee we are going to be talking about the repair and healing and then what happens when it goes wrong so kind of already pointed out your inflammatory process attracts all the white blood cells in order to fight this injury well the first thing it has to do is get rid of the damaged tissue we covered that then it removes the inflammatory debris what's the inflammatory debris Yeah, pretty much. It's all of the the dead bacteria carcasses and the dead um, white blood cell carcasses. So you know, it's it's yeah, a whole bunch of cellular death debris. So then, once all of that has been cleared out, then they can start um, the tissue restoration. Now, the restoration of the tissue is the regeneration of the cells. So there's different layers. You know, each type of cell, each type of layer within the tissue, wherever the injury was, is going to have to regrow. Re healthy cells will have to replicate. There are stimulations or there are stimulants uh, like growth hormones and such that are targeting into that area to speed up that growth process so that area grows faster than the associate or surrounding tissue. But it is still a slow um, growth process. So anyway, all right, so um, these are some of the different types of cells um, that you're gonna see. Um, 
the, the label cells or libel cells, these are cells like in our skin, bones, and things like that. These are cells that are constantly being divided and replacing each other. You can see the stable cells, they have to be replaced by regeneration. That means um, this is kind of like your blood cells in your marrow and things like that, where they're um, they're going to take uh, they, they require a specific location to be creating them to regenerate those cells. Where And then you have your permanent cells, like a lot of our neurons and our nerve tissue cells. They do not replicate and they cannot be regenerated. So they're pretty much, if it's damaged, it's done. Um, that's why strokes lead to per often lead to permanent damage and death. Now, that doesn't mean, or it's not a neuro class. We'll deal with neuro later. But anyway just because the cells were damaged doesn't mean that person lost that function in the spinal cord it normally does but all right so primary and secondary intention all right primary intention is when you have a clean wound that the and that uh the sides of the wound are coming together they're touching each other that way when the tissue starts to knit back together the two sides of the damaged tissue are already in contact and so a very small amount of uh, scar tissue and connective tissue is needed to hold it together when you have secondary intention this is where you have gaping wounds now gaping wounds could be because of the type of injury it was it could be because the injury is over a stretch zone where the skin is being pulled apart or it could mean that there was inflammation infection or whatever that has swollen the area up caused it an eruption a pus eruption or something like that and now you have a large open wound in which case a scab forms over the surface and underneath that scab you get this uh new granular tissue this is called um granulation and these cells start knitting together creating a very thin epithelial outer layer and then that holds in the um moisture and everything underneath this is kind of like let's say you get like an avulsion on your hand or on your arm i did this one time slipping on a metal roof and i cut a uh, section out of the pad of my hand here and took a chunk out of it well i mean it wasn't a big deal cleaned it up and it started to heal but it had a nice scar for a while but i noticed after um the skin and the scab fell off the skin was basically a continuation of the outer layer epithelial skin but when i would touch it i could feel the dent the wound the size of the wound was still under the skin because the outer layer had used secondary intention to close over the wound and then the inner layer tissues had to be recreated underneath to fill back in you know the to fill in the um the pad of my hand so that's um how secondary intention works so we see that in the larger wounds secondary intention as you would expect takes incredibly longer than primary intention you could cut your finger stitch it up and it'll be healed in a week to 10 days no big deal Secondary intention, because you, the stitches aren't holding the wound together, it's gaping open, or if you don't touch, uh, you don't keep it closed, it could be weeks uh, trying to get that to heal. All right, so what's going to cause our body not to heal properly? Well, we've already mentioned the infection. If the bacteria, if there's a heavy load of bacteria or other foreign bodies in there and our white blood cells are having to remove those, healing doesn't happen you know the regrowth of tissue won't happen until the um, infection is removed right so all that has to finish first now another issue is inadequate blood supply what what conditions do you know of that would result in an inadequate blood supply Absolutely, diabetes. I know it's listed below under systemic conditions. Technically, it is a systemic condition because, you know, it's going to affect all of our bodies. But at that local level, poor blood supply to that tissue caused by diabetes will slow or prevent healing. This is why diabetics are at such great risk of injuries to their foot and will often end up with amputations why because they got an injury they the injury couldn't heal itself 
it was a, it probably a very, very, very minor injury, and that's a, something to stress to diabetic patients. Once neuropathy, not neuropathy, but once vascular breakdown starts to happen, once that microvascular impacts of diabetes take place, the smallest cuticle, the smallest hangnail pipe wound can turn into a serious infection because there is no way to get the products of an immune response to that or an inflammatory response to that tissue. White blood cells will not show up. Inflammatory um, inhibitors and um, mediators will not show up. And so the back, any bacteria that lives naturally on the skin will have a heyday taking over and enjoying and feasting off of the nutrients the body cells provide as they are broken down, necrose, and turned into gangrene. And, and that's, that's the long and the short of it. Now, diabetes being systemic, same with AIDS, why AIDS? what yeah the immunodeficiency when you don't have an immune system you don't have adequate t-cells and b-cell function to help and actually aids is a destruction of your activator and helper cells those activator and helper cells are going to prevent a um If the activator and helper cells are not present, then the, the killer T cells can't target their um, the bad tissues. The macrophages can't um, be stimulated when they're running out of energy because the helper cells aren't there. So that, that's the issue that you're dealing with with AIDS is they don't have that reserve. They don't have that support. Um, foreign bodies. You're right. If the um, if there's dirt, if there's shrapnel, if there's an object of some sort still in the wound, the wound will not close. Um, and then corticosteroids. We talked a little about corticosteroids last uh, class when we were talking about the stress response. What do corticosteroids do? Or how do they affect? Yeah, they 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 reduce inflammation. That's why we give them to asthma patients and COPD patients. That's why we use them. They were used for a while for swelling of spinal cord injuries. Um, by suppressing the inflammation, they prevent the tissue swelling. They stop the uh, dilation of the capillaries. They basically stop the function of histamines and leukotrienes. More so the, histam the leukotrienes and the cytokines. Um, histamines, not so much, but they have an impact on that. They slow that inflammatory process down. And then I already mentioned wound separation earlier. That really should be local, in my opinion. Not, I don't see why it's systemic because like, yeah, but whatever. All right, so when are in, uh, when if wound, when trauma is not healed, then you end up in this chronic uh, phase. The chronic phase is where maybe you have bacteria or some form of pathogen of any nature in the wound that you can't get rid of and so the wound actually grows around it and your white blood cells fill a it's they form a tubercle tubercle around the uh, inflammation spot this could mean bacteria this could be a foreign object or something along those lines it could even be a parasite basically the body has determined that it cannot destroy that um invader and so it forms this barrier around it using white blood cells now of course the white blood cells are going to degrade so it's constantly needing a resupply of these white blood cells in order to resist this um excuse me to resist whatever this persistent infection is that's why a um, person, and we, it's called a tubercle, but call it tuberculosis because that bacteria um, uh, acts.
it'll come to me in a little bit. Anyway, the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, when they sh when when you've been exposed to it, oftentimes your body, if you have a strong immune system, will uh, surround it and um, encapsulate it in your lungs, uh, in these tubercles, and that's where the name came from, the tuberculosis. Um, and the um, then one day when another infection, another inflammatory process, or something that causes immunosuppression diminishes your immune system's ability, then those tubercles stop getting the constant supply of white blood cells that they need, and they start to degrade and break down and the bacteria on the inside is released and then the patient will go into an active infection. This is why you could get a TB skin test, test positive because all that's doing is seeing, do you have antibodies against that um, bacterium? Um, uh, it's driving me nuts, hang on. Mycobacterium, the myco meaning wax, mycobacterium tuberculosis. The tubercle concept was named before the bacteria itself was identified. It was actually thought that tuberculosis was caused by these growths because they found the tubercles in um, dissection after death or post-mortem dissections, but um, it was a while before it was identified. Oh, that's a, um, a bacteria. And then, anyway, mycobacteriums. Mycobacteriums are um, very hard to destroy with both our body, our body's defenses, and our um, antibiotics because they have a strong waxy structure around them. Not only is it like a capsule, but it's like this straddle, um, this uh, scaffold is what it's called. But it's this network that surrounds the entire bacteria in a waxy substance that is very hard for our um, white blood cells to attach to. And it's kind of like, like when you put bitters on your kid's pacifier and they don't want to eat it. So white blood cells do not want to eat mycobacterium because it, they, they can't connect to it. it. It just doesn't work. And so that's why it's really hard for our bodies to remove tuberculosis. So they do the TP skin test. You have a positive reaction. That means you've had the antigen in your body. You have antibodies against it. You're like, okay, well, uh, now we need to do a chest x-ray. They shoot a chest x-ray. Do we see tubercles? No, you have a clean chest x-ray. What that means is you were exposed to that crap but somehow your body fought it off. But they'll have to keep doing chest x-rays to make sure that you don't form tubercles in your lungs. You've got tubercles in your lungs. Yeah, that's not good, but it's not bad. Like you don't have an active infection. You're not contagious, but you will. they will try to destroy those and get rid of that for you so that you don't have a illness in the future that will cause tuberculosis to flare up and then you'll end up with tuberculosis. And that, incident in the future could just be an extended period of chronic stress that uh, pushed your immune system to the limit and now you can't uh, resist the tubercles in your lungs, the bacterial infection in your lung. So anyway, so those are some of the things that will lead to our chronic inflammation and a short description of what tuberculosis is. What do you have to wear to protect yourself from tuberculosis? Say that again. Yep, yeah, a HEPA filter, a HEPA filter respirator. Yep, uh, or uh, which is also known as an N95. N95 filters will protect you from a um, tuberculosis uh, bacteria. They're very small um, bacteria, but a normal surgical mask, you know, a non-fitted surgical mask is not tight enough or um, well, it's not tight enough to your sealed enough to your face, nor is it a tight enough weave to stop tuberculosis if somebody was to get it on, uh, if you were exposed to it. So, but the N95 is. So, um, and of course, if you've been exposed or treated a tuberculosis positive patient or suspected tuberculosis patient, do not reuse that N95. That N95 um, should be. 
destroys because you have tuberculosis bacteria on it. You got mycobacterium and they're going to replicate and you will get sick if um, they do. So, um, and if you're scratching your head about, well, if what he's saying is true, yeah, please don't ask. Please don't go there. Do not get me started. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just enjoy ignorance. Ignorance is bliss. All right. So now we're going to move into the variances. What are abnormal immune responses? What are circumstances that are unusual? Hypersensitivity. This is when our body reacts overly aggressively or inappropriately to an immune response. The immune system is reacting the way as it should. There is a, there is a trigger that should be there. We should react. But then instead of having a scaled appropriate level reaction, the reaction becomes out of control. So allergies is when a substance makes you react that perhaps I don't react to. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have an out of control reaction. It's just you've typed antibodies against something that not everybody has antibodies against. Um, everybody who gets stung by a wasp will have pain. That's going to be miserable. It won't be fun. But not everybody who gets stung by a wasp is going to have large amounts of swelling in hives and rashes breaking out. And then even fewer people will start having the systemic um, response, the anaphylactic response, where they have widespread um, vasodilation and issues like that. So those are levels of the allergic reaction. Now, autoimmunity, this is when your T cells have become typed against your body itself. So there's a very rigorous training process that T cells are supposed to go through in order to prevent them from attacking your body. If that gets altered, those T cells can be typed to your tissue and start destroying your tissue. This is what we see in MS. We see this in lupus. We see this in, um, actually now it's believed that diabetes type one is a form of auto, well, not the only, but a form of uh, cause, a cause of diabetes type one is an auto autoimmune attack of the pancreas. Um, so there's a number of different autoimmune disorders. Rheumatoid arthritis, that's another one. Now, isoimmunity, this is a... Um, this is when you, like, you've had an organ transplant or a blood transfusion and your body is attacking them. It's not autoimmunity because it's not your tissue, but because it's in your body and it's supposed to be there, we call it isoimmunity. It's still not I ideal. Most of your allergy reactions are, well, not most, your allergic reactions are going to be humorally mediated through antibodies, IgE. I, I've mentioned that a few times for a reason. IgE is an allergic reaction, but your auto and isoimmunities, those are your cellular immunity where your T cells are doing the killing. Now, I'm not going to get too far into these individual hypersensitivity reactions, type one versus type two. Type... This, it's, not, it's not a huge deal, okay? We know allergic reactions, and when they turn into an anaphylaxis, we're going to give epi as a sub-Q or intermuscular. We have a chapter on that. We have a whole chapter dealing with that. But type one, those are the big ones. Those are those scary ones that move really fast. Um, this is where you're going to um, see your transfusions, like blood transfusions and things like that. This is where you have a autoimmune uh, issue. And then here you see um, another form of autoimmune, a much longer process. Do not worry about your types of immunities, all right? You can understand what this means, all right? Uh, allergy, auto, and ISO, but do not worry about these type one, two, three, and four.
Now, um, and this is just literally what I was explaining a minute ago. Oh, okay, so there it's called listing you some options of autoimmune or descriptions of autoimmune conditions. Mention those, most of those. All right, so immunodeficiencies. I've already talked, we've talk, mentioned AIDS and we've talked about corticosteroids and such. Um, there are several other forms of immunodeficiencies. A really interesting is the IgA ones where patients do not produce, um, they lack the DNA capability of making um, the a necessary immunoglobulin A, right? So all anything immunoglobulin A, like which is supposed to be floating around in your blood, looking for bacteria, looking for crap that could true genuinely harm you, you can't produce those antibodies. So um, there's some interesting uh, newer treatments where they're using interferons and immunoglobulin injections to try to compensate for that genetic um, defect. Um, so just to point out, anytime we find genetic mutations in the human body, they typically lead to a problem, uh, like you can't produce this or your blood cells do that. Um, there's very, very few genetic defects that I have um, read about or heard about that I would consider to be a benefit. Um, I have a friend who has a genetic defect. Well, his kid has the genetic defect that he has six functional fingers on each hand. Um, I think they call it polydactyl. He had, um, same with his feet. He had an extra toe on each foot, but they were, um, they didn't have enough. They didn't actually have bones going into him. It was just the skin. So they had those removed when he was an infant. But his uh, hands, they have full flanges, fingernail, connect to the wrist. I mean, they literally look like another pinky. He has six fingers on each hand. So uh, buying gloves is going to be a real pain in the butt for him when he gets older. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool. So I, we don't give him high five. We go high six. Or technically, we call it high 11 for the combination. I did read about people who are born with two penises that are like functional and all that. And I'm like, okay, that is interesting, but I guess it could be a benefit, but that's the closest thing to a mutation I've heard of that would be beneficial. I still haven't seen anybody who can read minds and levitate metal and shape shift. All right, so now we have acquired immunodeficiencies. Remember, these are genetic. These are problems that are managed but not corrected. It's very hard to correct even these, um, but as you can see, things like stress, um, hypoperfusion, which is shock, um, damage to organs, decreased nutrition. These things can be uh, managed and improved and therefore the auto or uh, the acquired immunodeficiency can be reversed or prevented um, I mean there's lots of different diseases that are completely the result of inadequate nutrition but also keep in mind that the nutritional deficiencies don't have to mean well you weren't eating good food it could mean that you had poor blood flow due to shock or trauma or even diabetes that prevented the nutrition from getting to where it needed to be. And so those tissues suffered as a result. All right. Treatment induced immunodeficiencies. What's a, uh, what's an example of that treatment induced iatrogenic treatment induced. Absolutely. Treatment induced immunodeficiencies are, for example, when you have a immuno or um, chemotherapy of some sort and its chemical actions on your body destroys your body's tissue as well as the, the dangerous tissue or the, the target tissue. And so 
immunodeficiencies. Idiosyncratic is when a reaction happens that was not expected. Um, it's very unique that it it's a it may have been a known side effect, but it's an extremely rare um, side effect that is unexplainable. A para, um, paradoxical reaction is idiosyncratic, meaning unexplainable, but it is not not all are. So paradoxical reactions are when you gave a patient nitroglycerin and instead of their blood pressure dropping, their blood pressure went up. Or when you gave a patient Ativan and instead of becoming sedated, they became uh, berserk. They went nuts. Those are paradoxical. Those are both idiosyncratic. Those are unusual conditions. So there are others out there where it's like we gave them medication to help their immune system and now their immune system gave up. Kind of a thing. Now we talked about stress last week. Remember how constant physical or mental stress leads to increased production of corticosteroids, which suppress the immune system. Hence, you have immunosuppression. And we've mentioned AIDS multiple times. All right, um, how do we treat them? Well, here's your examples. Uh, why would bone marrow transplant be a treatment for an immune deficiency? Yeah, the, the bone marrow is where the blood cells are formed. So if you could do a bone marrow transplant and start forming blood cells again, or um, yeah, white blood cells and things like that again, you've treated that immunodeficiency. Um, transfusions of immunoglobulins, transfusions of white blood cells, um, IV um, uh, gamma globulins, it's basically injections of the, immuno, uh, the uh, antibodies. All right, now disease processes as a whole. Okay, so we're moving from our discussion of how inflammation, healing, and in the immune system works into what are disease processes in the body. This part of the chapter gets, it, it moves through a lot of stuff really fast, and it's gonna give you a whole lot of individual little like, oh, here's an example. This is not complete. This is not a uh, exhaustive list because the entire rest of the textbook is focused on all of these different disease processes. So, genetic, you know, inherited, environmental, you were exposed to chemicals, you were exposed to bacteria or microorganisms or whatever it happened, happened to be something around you caused or predisposed you to have that illness or disease. And then anatomic. This could mean, um, while this sounds like it should be genetic, things like scoliosis or um, your issues with your colon, the development, the malrotation of the colon. Uh, I think if I remember right, uh, spina bifida, where your uh, parts of your central nervous system are developing outside of your spinal cord or outside of your body. These are not genetic origin. It's not a DNA issue or you know a lack of chromosome like, um, Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a genetic alteration of chromosomes. These could happen while in utero, but they are alterations in your anatomy due to a um, modified or interrupted growth and development process in, while in the womb. So it's possible this could have been caused by um, chemicals that your mother was exposed to. It could be a lack of oxygen or a lack of nutrients. These are things that just resulted in an anatomical change. So if a patient has uh, aortic stenosis, which is a tightening, narrowing, and hardening of the aorta, they're going to be predisposed to any disease caused by a lack of oxygen and nutrients to the tissue because they can't pump blood enough. They can't get enough oxygen delivered to the uh, malrotation of the colon. If your colon is twisted, you're not going to get good nutrient absorption and water absorption, so you're going to be predisposed to um, that kind of a thing. That kind of a thing, yeah. Nutrient deficiency illnesses. MS is immunologic. This is an autoimmune issue, where and there's we've mentioned tons of those. 
Now, we can avoid some of these stress, these triggers, you know, maybe try to avoid stress and have, get good nutrition, get, um, you know, limit the alcohol consumption, uh, avoid smoking. Um, I won't say stop alcohol consumption because I don't want to, but I don't like smoking, so I'll say stop smoking, you know, because that's my bias, but, you know, probably wrong. All right, um, and then you have age, right? A infant is probably not going to be struggling with um, a ruptured ovarian cyst, but they might have immune issues. A um, infant or a, a baby may not have os um, osteoporosis, but they can have osteogenesis imperfecta, so it's a different type of thing. So there's a lot of different diseases based on age. And then you have things that are more prevalent in men. Uh, prostate cancer is far more prevalent in men. Um, uh, cervical cancer is more prevalent in women. Unless you live in California, then they seem to, then, then you know, whatever. All right, causal, it looks like casual, but it's causal risk versus non-causal risk. Um, this meaning causal is this will cause that. A bullet in the head will cause head trauma or death. It, we know that mycobacterium tuberculosis causes the infection tuberculosis and isolated uh they use the coke po postulates um to say that every person every subject with this disease had this organism and it was cultured out of that organism or it was cultured out of that sub subject and anything exposed to that organism acquired the same disease and that's basically the coke postulates that in order to say that there's a causal factor, everyone who had X also had Y. And we were able to take Y from them, culture it, and expose it to and expose other groups, and those other groups acquired the same disease. They acquired X. And that's how you would say that X is caused by Y. Non-causal risk factors are we can't say that this action, chemical, habit, whatever, causes this disease, but we see that a lot of the people with that disease have that in their history. So, you know, for example, consumption of alcohol is associated with um, drunk driving. Does that mean you will be you will dr uh, drink and drive if you've consumed alcohol? No. There are people who drink who don't drink and drive. But you're not going to have a drunk driver who didn't drink. There is one guy in England. There's one guy I heard about. Now that's a different story. Technically, he was still drunk. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The guy who has an auto brewery in his intestines somehow instead of just having bacteria or I can't remember if his a, he has a fungal in not infest infestation but he has fungus in his he's basically has yeast in his intestines that whenever he drinks sugar or not drink sugar but consumes carbohydrates the yeast ferments the carbo the sugars into alcohol and he gets drunk ba just by eating carbs. Oh, he's like, I swear, officer, I didn't drink anything. And everybody's like, no, he never drinks. He doesn't drink, but yet he's drunk. So it was interesting. But anyway, so that's the example of a causal risk versus non-causal. We know it's associated, kind of like stress and heart attack. Not everybody who has heart attacks has stress. Not everybody who has stress has heart attacks. However, lots of people who have had heart attacks were uh, had a lot of stress and people have yeah anyway the, it it's just showing a higher incidence of it a higher associated risk um 
terms that you should be familiar with okay like read that know those terms those are important you know new cases versus number of cases um morbidity means the disease so if you hear a term somebody says uh what comorbidities do they have or what are their comorbidities what are other diseases that they have right a um, I mentioned earlier how you could be exposed to tuberculosis, get a positive skin test, and you do not have, I mean, you could be exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, get the positive PPD test, but not actually have the tuberculosis infection, all right? So you've had the exposure, but you don't have morbidity. Morbidity is having the disease. So here are some um, causes or contributing causes to some of these different diseases. Do you know the most, you know what virus is the most common upper respiratory infection head cold? You know, we call it like the seasonal cold or, you know, not hay fever, but um, yeah, just a cold. The most common cause of the cold are coronaviruses. There's like eight, eight different coronaviruses that are known um, to cause uh, common cold-like symptoms, head colds, congestion, stuff like that. And then you start getting into the SARS and the others, but... All right, familial tendencies versus genetic factors, right? So you have your genetic diseases like um, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is directly related to specific uh, genes, right? And we can test mom and dad and find out, do they have the genes? Now, both of the parents have to have it in order for the child to have the dominant trait, the actual disease if one parent has the recessive gene then they um the child will likely have what well, could or could not have the recessive gene but they will not uh they will not have sickle cell they have both parents have to get it so that's autosomal recessive there's autosomal dominant which means if one of your parents has it there's like a really good chance you'll get it recessive means they both have to have it or you won't get it um The cool thing is, does anybody know what the benefit of having the recessive gene for sickle cell is? There's an actual benefit for you personally having the recessive. If both parents had it and you have the disease, obviously nobody would consider that a benefit. But there's a benefit to the autosomal recessive condition. People who carry the recessive gene, you know, the, only, the one half of the um, sickle cell gene are not able to get malaria. And that's why it became um, associated with people from the tropical regions, from um, racial backgrounds in the tropical regions where malaria was common from the mosquito population, but people who sur died of malaria didn't reproduce people who survived were found to be the ones that had the recessive genes and so that's why that is a um a trait common to the asians and africans that are in that tropical window of um where the mosquito population it's known for carrying malaria You'll, if you read about uh, sickle cell, it'll say like it's predominant in um, African and Asian continents, or on the African and Asian continent, and in uh, those pe people who are that descendants, or from Italy, Italian descendants. Anybody know why suddenly Italian as well as the Asian and African continents? Yeah. 
Yeah, pretty much because the Romans conquered like the entire known world at the time and all load, all roads led to Rome and they took slaves and armies and citizens and all that from all those countries back to Rome and started a massive migration of human um, genetics. And so now those tropical disease traits are actually common in um, the Italian genetics. All right, so uh, yeah, we've already talked about allergies, asthma, and immune disorders, right? Hyperactive versus hypoactive. Immune, uh, uh, yeah, never mind. We're moving on. I think we're good on this. Hey, look, this is that same thing that we saw earlier where the allergen appears in the first time you're exposed to it. The lymphocyte turns into a plasma cell lots of antibodies are produced they fight off the inf um the allergen the allergen is removed but they remain on the mast and basophil cells until the next time the allergen shows up and then the cells immediately recognize it and instantly start um releasing histamines and attacking that allergen and absorbing that allergen and fight um mounting the assault so where you can see on the top part there you can see the primary response and then the bottom one is the secondary response the difference here is this is specific to histamine related and ige meat excuse me ige responses those are very rapid and that's why a patient with um anaphylaxis could go from everything's okay exposed to everything's not okay very quickly um in that secondary response anaphylaxis being that second response but a massive release of histamine now cancer what is cancer well remember earlier when i was talking about how a cell is con well is regularly re replicating every cell well most cells are called label cells they're going to replicate routinely well when cancer or cancer happens when during that replication process an outside influence alters the dna of the new cell so when the chromosomes are being separated and typed from one cell to the other, instead of a new skin cell developing, UV light or a uh, toxic uh, sunscreen or exposure to radiation or exposure to a chemical or something like that alters the DNA replication. And so now you have new DNA that doesn't make any sense. And that abnormal DNA instead of being destroyed becomes the foundation of the new cell and that new cell starts doing things now if a cell replicates and the dna is um, mutated to allow the cell to not produce something or allow the cell to not protect itself from invasion of water that cell's going to be destroyed and gone and it'll never become a cancer cell. But a cancer cell is a cell that when it replicates and when it's mutated, it's mutated into an aggressive growth pattern. That growth pattern, it, while it may release a chemical or hormones or something like that, only the ones with aggressive growth patterns will replicate. And now you have a rapidly replicating, rapidly growing cell strain, just like we were showing with bacteria. Bacteria will constantly replicate and only the strong survive. Well, this is kind of like what cancer is. It's a mutation. And now you have tissue growth in an area that it wasn't supposed to be. And it's generally of a different type of tissue. And so like when you get lung cancer, it's not because there's um, tissue dying. Well, I mean, there is, but it's not, oh, all your alveoli just turned into bones. Like, no, what it is is you have rapidly growing cells on the side of a bronchial somewhere that have turned into this big tumor and that big tumor is crushing your lung cells and your alveoli and now you can't breathe kind of a thing. So the tumor may simply cause a problem because it's taking up space 
or stealing nutrients from the rest of the body. So there's just lots of variations there. But a cancer is just an abnormal, rapid growth of cells. Different types of cancers. You have your endocrine issues. We've talked about diabetes before. I mentioned how um, type 1 diabetes is often autoimmune, but there is a family um, trait or family trend within uh, diabetes. If your parents had hypertension, if your parents had high diabetes or heart disease, it puts you at a significantly increased risk, right? They tend to show up in families. Hematologic, blah, blah, blah. All right, so here's another example of a hematologic condition with where you're not able to absorb iron properly. And so it causes you to have anemia, low iron levels hemoglobin levels mm, all right then there's cardiovascular conditions again all of these are things that we are going to get into quite heavily in the future we're not um we have, we have entire chapters on cardiovascular so i'm not going to delve into them too much but um it is important to remember, no matter what, that just because a person passed out, it could be life-threatening, but it isn't necessarily life-threatening. Sometimes it's very easy to identify, but without a very clear, oh, you passed out because you were doing Netflix and chill for the last eight hours, and you stood up too fast, and you blacked out. Or you were sitting in your lawn chair on the city park listening to music on the 4th of July for the last eight hours, drinking nothing but beer, and now you're sweating and dehydrated and you passed out when you stood up. Sometimes that happens, but it could also be associated with a number of other things, and the scary ones are a genetic defect that's very hard to recognize until it happens that causes you to just go into arrhythmias un. Uh, unexpectedly. This is showing some pediatric uh, congenital heart defects where like, maybe valves into the aorta or something like that aren't working properly or the valves into the um, from the atria into the uh, ventricles and these have to be surgically repaired. That is what's called a staghorn kidney stone. That is a kidney stone that forms inside the renal pelvis. Let me pull up a picture of the renal pelvis real quick so that you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so here you can see the ureter coming down from the kidney. This entire area here is the renal pelvis, and you can see all of the calyxes coming off of it that go up in, into the nephrons within the tissue of the, uh, the outer layer of the kidney. And that's called the... renal um, cortex. That's the renal cortex, this is the renal medulla. Anyway, this is the renal pelvis. The curve that you were seeing a second ago in the picture, let me see if I can, all right, yeah, there we go. That'll work for you. This curve here matches this curve here. These points here would match up with all of these points here in the calyxes. So 
as you can see this this tape measure is almost six centimeters in length and this is longer than that so that is like an eight centimeter tape measure that's you know 2.54 centimeters in an inch that's a three inch long kidney stone that kidney stone cannot be peed out right the person is not going to pass that through their ureter and their urethra that has to be surgically removed but yeah that would be one miserable day but i want to just that is a big kidney stone All right, so um, GI disorders, lack of enzymes for digesting various proteins, or uh, lactase is specific hydrate, not a protein, but. Uh, so these while they are more uh family indicated that they, they they can be seen in a number of different circumstances uh like multiple sclerosis uh or ms this is an autoimmune disorder where your the nerve fibers are damaged the myelin sheaths specifically are damaged and then you have a uh inhibition of or an interruption of neuron transport and or neuron signal transfer this is showing you alzheimer's where it's on the top you see the neurons within the brain uh functioning properly and then in the bottom you can see them being uh calcified and plaque building up around them uh reducing the uh, uh make basically making it so they can't uh function properly or destroying them straight gone like those neurons no longer exist therefore other neurons have to learn to do the same job now there is a huge familial connection with psychiatric disorders uh for a long time they thought it was um because of nurture you know if your patients not your patients if your parents were dealing with things like bipolar depression or schizophrenia their influence on your life would cause you to um develop the same traits kind of as an exposure thing however twin studies that have done that were done through the latter half of the um 1900s you know 50 60 70 80 90 and even later twin studies were show were done on sets of biologic twins where, that were put up for adoption or maybe one of them was put up for adoption where the um and they even did it on some where both were put up for adoption and were adopted by different families so you have scenarios in which one of the twins is growing up with the biological parents while others are growing the other is growing up with adoptive family and what they found was even though the adoptive child did not have exposure to the biological parents, they were showing an increased uh, tendency towards the same conditions that the biological parents have. Like their risk uh, or their likelihood of developing the psychological diseases or psychiatric diseases was greater than it was for the average population even though they were being raised with parents who didn't have those psychological diseases. So there is, there is some form of genetic transfer of those conditions that is not fully understood yet. All right, and then that gets into the stress and disease and we discussed stress and disease the other day. So we've already gone over that. We have hammered a huge amount of material um this is not easy material this is stuff you're going to need to go over and over again um you need to r watch my videos um go okay like i don't get this part fine go find a, another youtube video look up crash course look up khan academy um just google the question the, the topic you know look up 
autosomal uh, autosomal recessive disorders. See what you can find where he explains why two traits come in together or only one trait, that kind of a thing. Kind of deep dive on it. The best way to prepare for an exam is by understanding the material beyond what is necessary for the exam. That might sound overwhelming. That You're probably like, what the crap, you idiot. How do I have time for that? I can't understand what I have to know. How am I supposed to understand more? Well, actually, I've always found that when I take it a step further, I understand where it's going, the bigger picture sure what's going on and then I get it like the whole concept makes sense so when I hand I'm handed the exam it's not that I'm spitting off the answer to a or to number two is a because I've seen the question before but I understand the process it's asking and so it makes sense so that's how I would recommend prepping for this exam there are some practice quizzes do not overuse them there's a lot of assignments, please do them. I'm telling you, those assignments won't do you a bit of good in prepping for the exam if you don't do them until after the exam, if you get them late. They're in designed to put your nose in that book. We want you studying, we want you learning. You got a question, you got my email. You're confused, reach out, right? You wanna make sure you got it right, reach out. No big deal. Um, Next Wednesday, so basically we have two weeks until the exam. Next Wednesday is a review day. In preparation for the review day, I would strongly encourage you to have as much of your homework done as you can and have done some practice quizzes so that you can see what you're up against. There will be, internet's gone cuckoo again. There will be a quiz next week. It will be a large quiz. It will cover the entirety of chapter nine. There might be some stuff from chapter seven in there or eight because this is a, com a cumulative quiz, right? The stuff on your, ex not quiz, unit. The stuff on the unit exam could be from any of those chapters. So anything on any of the chapters we've done so far, there will be a big quiz on next week. This is not the exam. This does not count as an exam grade. Do not worry about that. It is a quiz grade. You've got a lot of other assignments that are also quiz grades. So if you don't do great on it, it's not the end of the world, but this will be a really great metric for where you are in preparation for the exam. Once the quiz is over, the review is going to be heavily focusing well the the review will help focus the rest of the day looking at what are we missing what are we struggling on and then the rest of the day will be a uh, pattern or a process of answering questions going over the hard stuff taking um, different views working on uh, breakout projects how different things work and stuff like that and that that's how the remainder of next wednesday will go so remember, there will be a quiz at the start of class, and then the rest of the day is review. The exam for this unit is in two weeks. I know you're brain fried. Enjoy your weekend. You too.